Good evening and welcome to the regular Planning Commission meeting for March 22, 2011. My name is Kevin Staunton. I am the Vice Chair of the Planning Commission. I'm sitting in for Mike Fisher tonight, who is the Chair of the Planning Commission. He, uh, he was stranded in Duluth with the snow and not able to be with us this evening. Um, so let me just start with the agenda. Uh, first, Jackie, if you could do the roll. Present. Here. 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 Thank you. Uh, the first item of business is approval of the minutes uh, for the January 26 and February 23 meetings. If we could start with the January 26 minutes, are there any comments or revisions that uh, anyone would like to make? Seeing none, I'd take a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. And Jackie, you'll file those minutes. Thank you. Um, the minutes for February 23, any um, comments or revisions to those minutes? I see a note at my table that uh, Chair Fisher had asked for some additions to the minutes on page two, right prior to where the motion is made on the election of officers and adoption of bylaws. Let me just briefly read in what he's proposing. Chair Fisher acknowledged the sentiment of the commission and pointed out that the ordinance stipulates a two-year term for chair. Continuing, Fisher stated he was very happy with the accomplishments of the last two years bylaws, ordinance rewrite, PUD, sketch plan review, adding that at this time, it's time to elect a new chair and have the new chair bring their own ideas to the commission. Fisher stated that he would feel comfortable continuing the annual meeting to the next PC meeting. The commission formally requested that the annual meeting adopting bylaws and electing a new officers be continued to the next meeting of the planning commission, noting that two planning commissioners were absent. Any further comments on the minutes of uh, February 23rd? If not, I'd take a motion to um, approve those minutes with the revisions recommended by Chair Fisher. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please signify the saying aye. 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 Opposed? And those minutes will be filed as well. Um, the first item of business for this evening after the approval of minutes is the annual meeting that we just referenced in the me in meeting minutes from February 23rd. This item was continued from our February 23rd meeting and there are really a couple of items that we need to do in the annual meeting. Um, one is to adopt our bylaws and then second is to elect new officers for the coming year. Uh, I am going to recommend that we tackle the bylaws first um, as those members of the Commission are aware and as members of the public may or may not be aware, we adopted bylaws for the Commission for the first time last year and the proposal for this evening would be that we, um, we approve those and readopt those for the coming year. Um, one item that is relevant to the other annual meeting business that we'll be conducting this evening is that um, unlike past years, our bylaws now uh, recognize three officers rather than just a chair and a vice chair, it also recognizes a secretary. And so this evening we'll need to, assuming we adopt these bylaws, we'll need to elect a new chair, a new vice chair, and a secretary. I had some discussions with Chair Fisher about what the duties of the, of the secretary would be. We're familiar with the chair and the vice chair. Uh, and what he was recommending from his experience the last two years as the chair of the commission, he indicated that um, a lot of his time has been spent over those two years um, reviewing the minutes that we have taken at each meeting. And Jackie does a great job of keeping track of what we do, particularly at the televised meetings, but there's often meetings that take place that aren't televised, particularly when we've done our zoning ordinance update meetings that are on um, the Wednesdays that are not regular meetings. 
And so there is some time that is necessary to kind of review those and make sure they're incorporating the things that transpired at the meeting. And he recommended that that be a duty that the secretary could work with our recording secretary on a monthly basis just to ensure that we are accurately um, reviewing those minutes before they come back to the Planning Commission each month. Any other thoughts about the secretary duties um, from members of the commission? Hearing none, um, I would take a motion to adopt the bylaws for this coming year. So moved. Second. Any further discussion on the bylaws? Hearing none, uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. The bylaws are adopted for the coming year. So with that, let's move to election of officers for the coming year. Um, as we discussed at our previous meeting, which I wasn't in attendance at, but the meeting minutes reflect, and members of the public may not be aware, um, the City Council has uh, adopted an ordinance that um, in addition to imposing term limits on members of various boards and commissions, also requires that no chair of a board or commission serve more than two, con more than two years consecutively. And Chair Fisher has been the chair for the last two years. And so he is stepping down and it is time for us to elect the new chair for this coming year to, uh, to lead the commission. And with that, I would take a nomination, a motion for a nomination for the chair for the coming year. Commissioner um, Carpenter. Carpenter. <laughs> uh, I'd like to move the uh, nomination of uh, Floyd Grable for chair. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? Uh, any further nominations? Seeing no further nominations, is there um, further discussion on the nomination of Mr. Grable as chair for the commission? Hearing none, I'll ask uh, all those in favor to signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Hearing none, <laughs> Commissioner Grable, congratulations. Thank you very much. And uh, I think it's appropriate at this time that we switch chairs and that you take the, uh, you take the gavel and, and you can lead us through the remaining elections of officers and agenda. Thank you. Let me say uh, thank you very much for uh, your support and the confidence. I look forward to uh, serving as chair, and I look forward to carrying on the legacy that uh, Michael Fisher has provided for this commission for the last two years. I think this commission, I was on the park board uh, for five years prior to the time I became uh, a member of this commission. I enjoyed my time on the park board, uh, but I have found this commission to be extremely uh, interesting, and I think the city is blessed with and has been blessed with a number of very fine commissioners on the Planning Commission, and I'm uh, very pleased to and, and proud uh, to be named chairman. So thank you very much. Uh, the next order of business is the uh, election a nomination and election of a vice chair. Uh, do we have uh, any nominations for the vice chair? Yes. Uh, I'd like to nominate that uh, Kevin Stone remain in the vice chair position. <clears throat> okay, there's been, Kevin, is there a second to that nomination? It's been moved and seconded. Are there any other nominations? Are there any other nominations? Hearing none, I'll take a motion to uh, Close the nominations and to elect Kevin Staunton as vice chair. So moved. Second. Second. Moved and seconded to close the nominations and elect Kevin as vice chair. Is there is, uh, uh, any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Congratulations. <laughs> you are now vice chair. <laughs> and we don't have to switch chairs. <laughs> there you go. Um, 
As Kevin mentioned earlier, the bylaws call for the office of secretary. Uh, and we will now undertake uh, nomination for the position of secretary. Uh, are there any nominations for the secretary of the commission? Mr. Chair, I would nominate um, Commissioner Jeff Carpenter if he is willing to serve in that role. Okay, there's been nominated. Is there a second to that nomination? Second. <clears throat> uh, are there other nominations? Having drafted the bylaws, you are completely familiar with the duties of secretary. Are you willing to undertake those duties? <laughs> I am. <laughs> uh, any other nominations? Hearing none, I will accept a motion to close the nominations and elect uh, Jeff Carpenter as secretary. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Very good. We have a panel of officers, Chairman Me, Kevin Staunton, Vice Chairman, and Jeff Carpenter as secretary. Thank you very much. Moving on to uh, new business. The first item of business is 2011-001.11a, Conditional Use Permit College City Design Builders, 4509 Garrison Lane. Carrie? Thank you, Chair Grable, members of the Planning Commission. <clears throat> our, next, our, our next item on the agenda is for a Conditional Use Permit, 4509 Garrison Lane. Property is located just north of the Crosstown um, on Nancy Lake. Property is located in a 100-year flood elevation as per the city's stormwater management plan. Closer look at the, at the site, you see the, the lake located on the south side of the property. This map on the screen indicates the, the uh, stormwater 100-year um, flood elevation within our stormwater management plan. What the applicant is requesting to do is tear down their existing Rambler style home, it's the home in the middle as shown on the screen, and build a new single family home, the existing home today. And this is a look at the home that they're proposing to build on the site. The request requires a conditional use permit that would allow the new first floor elevation to be more than one foot above the existing first floor elevation. This is a request um, our first request from our recently amended zoning ordinance. Specifically, the first floor elevation is proposed to be 2.4 feet above the existing first floor elevation. Again, the request requires a conditional use permit. And there's a couple of ways where you, we have the ability to request a conditional use permit. Essentially, it's if there's uh, groundwater issues associated with this with the site. And being that this property is located within a 100-year floodplain elevation for Nancy Lake, they have the ability to uh, request that conditional use permit. The uh, survey on the screen shows that the existing first floor elevation is 874.9, and the proposal is for 877.3, again, 2.4 feet above what exists today. Just to uh, let you know a couple of key elevations here. Again, the existing um, and proposed first floor elevations. The uh, existing low floor elevation or the basement level is uh, 867.2. The proposed low floor elevation is 867.8, so they would be raising that slightly. The Nancy Lake Ordinary High Water Elevation is 863, and the 100-year flood elevation is 865.4. Um, zoning or city code requires uh, structures to be at least two feet above that 100-year flood elevation. So again, the, as, as shown in the proposed low floor elevation, uh, they would exceed that as well, complying with code. Primary issue that staff considered is the, uh, the new home with the first floor elevation 2.4 feet higher than the existing first floor elevation reasonable for the site. In this case, staff does believe it is. Uh, three key reasons. First, the conditional use permit findings. Uh, there are four conditions, and two of those four have to be met. Conditions one and four, as outlined in the staff report, 
uh, are satisfied. Again, the first condition is that the site needs to be located within a 100-year floodplain per the city's stormwater management plan, and again, this site is. And the second condition is that the new home needs to fit the character of the neighborhood. In this case, uh, staff believes that it does fit the character of the neighborhood. This is a look at the existing streetscape. Again, the applicants provided some pictures that shows the existing house. And then a, a streetscape that focuses more on the existing home. But you get the idea, the, uh, the, the, um, the front door is slightly elevated uh, from what exists today. Uh, the existing grades generally uh, would be used. The, uh, the top of the structure is between two and six feet taller than the homes on, on either side of this home. Uh, the building code height for this structure is 15 feet. City code allows 30 feet, so it's well within the, the code requirement. And again, is Rambler style home. So staff believes that it does fit that uh, character of the neighborhood requirement. Uh, second, all other minimum code requirements in regard to setback, building height, all of that is met. And third, uh, because of that 100-year flood elevation, the applicant is unable to dig down deeper in order to meet that first floor elevation given, that, uh, given the, the floodplain elevation. They also would like to build a basement with an eight-foot ceiling. The current basement right now is at seven feet. Um, standard basements that we find throughout Edina are between eight and nine feet. So the eight-foot proposed uh, basement ceiling is reasonable. So with that, Staff is recommending approval of the conditional use permit subject to the conditions that are outlined in your staff report. And I want to draw your attention to one condition, uh, condition number three, and that is that the <clears throat> final grading and drainage plans are subject to review and approval of the city engineer prior to issuance of a building permit. That's standard with any building permit, but we've um, had some concern with the neighbor to the, I believe it's the west. Um, so the specific drainage in that area, we want to be, be cautious that uh, the proposal doesn't have any negative impacts on that adjacent property. So with that, I'll turn it over to the commission for any questions. Thank you. Uh, commission members, any comments or questions for the planner? Kerry, um, with respect to the uh, recent ordinance that was adopted, um, my understanding is that it um, it, it fixes the maximum uh, increase in elevation to two feet and it doesn't serve as a minimum. Is that, am I reading that correctly or is? The, the, uh, the code reads that any time you want a first floor elevation that exceeds one foot above the existing, potentially you could request a conditional use permit. There's not a maximum um, number that's established. It's just looking at what the request and is it reasonable given the, uh, the character of the neighborhood. But doesn't it establish that the, uh, um, that it, the increase can be up to two feet? Isn't, isn't that how that was originally adopted? No, there, were, there was no maximum established. There isn't. Right. Okay. Yeah, there was quite a bit of discussion okay. centered around that. Um, what should, should there be a minimum, should there be a maximum? But um, given that, that character of the neighborhood uh, condition that was added, I, I think that um, All right. resolves that issue. Carrie, this is partly our first test drive with our new ordinance, so I wanna make sure I'm, I'm reading it the right way as well. And it looks to me, looking at page three of your staff report, that there's these four elements. And as you say in the staff report, the applicant needs to satisfy one of the first three and then the fourth one. Correct. And so I understand how the fourth one is satisfied. It looks like it does. It's consistent with the character of the neighborhood. And, and I, I agree with that. Um, the first item in that talks about the first floor elevation being increased because of the 100-year the floodplain level. And the way I read it, it says, to the extent necessary to elevate the lowest level of the dwelling to an elevation of two feet above the 100-year flood elevation. So what they're doing is 2.4 feet above the 100-year flood elevation. So is it really the item number two that we need to satisfy? 
as opposed to item number one because they're going a bit beyond that two feet. The it, two feet is what's necessary to get them above, or, or am, I, am I understanding the facts incorrectly? Yeah, the, um, the code just requires, there's not a, um, it has to be two feet. It just talks about, um, well, let's see here. So they want to, just so that I get the numbers right, they want to, the, the proposed elevation would be what? You had that slide. Maybe if you could click back to that slide that summarized the proposed elevation numbers. Right, the next one. Yeah. So the proposed, is it the proposed low floor elevation that we're talking about? Or is it the proposed first floor elevation? It's the first floor elevation that requires the conditional use permit. And the 100 year well, the 100-year flood elevation is 865.4. Right. So two feet above that would be 867.4. Right. That, that's a code minimum. Um, they're requesting to go 0.4 feet above that, uh, just to build in a little a little safeguard there. The applicants have um, experienced flooding on this property before, so they'd, they'd like to build in a little extra safety net there. But doesn't that then require us to satisfy um, criteria number two? Because number one just says they get to go two feet above the 100 year and they're going 2.4 feet above. Now, don't get me wrong, I think they can get there. I just, I just want to make sure as we're using this going forward, isn't, yeah. it, isn't it that second element that we need to, you know, they've got the letter from the hydrologist, they've got, I understand the rationale for going another four tenths of a foot above the two feet. But it looks to me like item number one allows yeah, the, them two feet of latitude. But if they want to go beyond two feet, they have to get into one of those other. I think the intent of one is to get it at least two feet above. It doesn't say at least two feet. It just says to an elevation two feet above. But it does say to the extent necessary. So, I mean, if you took it to its logical conclusion, they could put it seven feet above the flood level. I mean, there wouldn't be any upper limit on that if that was the case. And we'd really just be analyzing the whether it fits the character of the neighborhood. And I, I don't think, after all of our discussion, that's really what we intended. Because I know and, and I, I think that the applicants have gone through and, and they've documented from a hydrologist and otherwise the reasons they want to go a little bit more than two feet above. And I'm okay with that. I just want to make sure that as we go through this in the record, the, the next time we get one of these, we're kind of interpreting it. We're all on the same sure. page. In, sure. in that case, it. you're saying that they would satisfy one, two, and four this evening, given their... I would say they, they satisfy two and four, okay. because the 2.4 is more than is necessary to get above, to get two mm -hmm. feet above the floodplain. Maybe we need to tweak the code a little more. Well, or I'm, I'm fine with it that way, and I think they've, they've met that. Um, and I'm prepared to support that. But I, I just want to make sure as we go forward, we're kind of thinking that through. I don't know if others have comments. Um, I, I do have a comment, especially in light of both of the comments uh, from uh, commissioners, uh, the two commissioners. Um, we had, an, a, as I recall, and it would be interesting to go back to those minutes, we had rather lengthy discussion about uh, did we want to set a minimum, a maximum, did we want to set an absolute? And the, putting the two feet in here was our a sort of a compromise, uh, and and I I would have I didn't read this um, as something over two feet. I read it as Commissioner Staunton is reading it as, as two feet. I I also have no problem with the 2.4 that is being requested, but I would concur uh, with Commissioner Staunton's recommendation that probably the two of the three uh, excuse me the two of the four conditions that are being met are, are number two and number four in this specific case would be how I would read it also. I would agree with that approach, and that's, that's kind of what I was struggling with. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Commissioner Staunton articulated more eloquently than I did, but I think that's, that's the issue. Other questions or comments for uh, the staff? Okay, thank you. Uh, would the uh, proponents care to uh, make a presentation?
Uh, Connie Carino, 4509 Garrison Lane. I don't know if you need that since you know that I'm the proponent, <laughs> but I'll just add that so you know. I might be calling on our builder or my husband who decided to chicken out right now. <laughs> I know you're, you're uh, looking at the CUP and it's all very new. Um, I guess I just want to clarify, when we were applying for it, I thought we, we met part of that condition one, which is because the comprehensive water resource management plan and the floodplain coming up to that minimum, plus what the hydrologist recommended, plus meeting the character of the neighborhood. So that's where we came up with the information. I think the, the big issue is we feel that we shouldn't really have to choose between um, using the, what's allowed to get the ceiling height and then, and or, and or um, the amount we need for fixing the flood and, and the water problem. So that's why we thought we met uh, some of the conditions in one, two, and then of course four. I think those are the numbers. But anyhow, so th that's why we went to the extent of having that hydrologist report. I think because we've been at various meetings, I think you know all of our issues, so I'm not going to go into the whole litany of the history of the problems with the property, because I think you're all well aware of those, except for maybe the two new commissioners. If you have any questions about the history of our issues, please, uh, that's what we're here for, to answer those. We think um, uh, Planning Director Teague certainly did an adequate job, more than adequate, in presenting the background. We'd like to reiterate that our proposed project is all about responsibly fixing these long-standing problems with our property and not just trying to sell a house with problems. We want to fix it, make sure it's sustainable, make sure it's there for the long term, and that it also meets the character of the neighborhood. In your packets, you have letters from several neighbors who support our proposed project. Many of these homeowners have had, lived in our neighborhood for many years. Uh, some have had similar problems with their homes, and some also are, are expecting to have problems. There was a letter that went out from the um, engineering department that says that several homes on Nancy Lake are expected to flood if the flood conditions uh, happen that, that, uh, that they might require sandbags. And in our property, I want to remind you that what, what we had talked about before in the earlier meetings, we get problems before any flooding happens. Our problems happen when the pond or the lake comes up to a certain point and then the groundwater comes up through the floor. So before there's any overland flooding, before it goes into the yard or would hit the structure, we're going to experience some flooding in our lower level. So the fact that that lake is at risk right now is very concerning to us, and it, sandbags won't help us in the least with that. Also, you have letters from some of our neighbors who are professionals in construction and architecture, and they've reviewed our plans in great detail and are very supportive of those projects, and they may even want to, some are here tonight, they may want to come up. Um, so finally, I guess I ask that you consider our proposal and that you approve it. Thank you. And we're available if you have any questions for us. Do you need it to stand here or? Yeah, there's probably going to be some questions, so you might just stand there. Stand, okay. Uh, questions? Mr. Staunton. So I just want to make sure that, so by doing the 2.4 feet, you're getting what you need to get in terms of getting above where you're concerned about the water and still getting your eight foot ceilings in the basement. Correct. You want to go over the math? Uh, Jeff Miller, 4509 Garrison Lane. Uh, yes, that would. So I just wanted to reiterate that we're asking for um, our first floor elevation to be 2.4 feet higher than the current house. The current ordinance allows a one foot. So in actuality, what we're asking for is 1.4 feet above what the current ordinance is. Um, as was mentioned, we did hire a hydrologist to review public data, to come out to the site. Um, he reviewed the comprehensive water plan, um, and he was the one that initially pointed out that we were in uh, the floodplain and um, helped us with the calculations as far as what, um, according to what the, the current uh, CUP is, that we had to uh, bring it up uh, two feet, our foundation two feet above what the, um, uh, what the, uh, I think it's called the bounce um, over the uh, normal water level is. Um, in addition, as was mentioned, we want to go from uh, having seven feet in our lower level to eight feet. Um, our, our builder, College City, has built uh, 
nearly 1,000 homes over the past decade, and we asked them to go back and look at some of their statistics. 70% uh, of the homes that they've built over the past decade have had 9-foot ceilings, 30 have had 8-foot, and none have had 7-foot. So we definitely feel that if we're going to be taxed for livable space on our lower level, that, that 8 feet is, is really a, uh, a minimum for usable livable space. Um, anybody who's six foot taller, uh, like myself, trying to get on a uh, treadmill on a seven foot ceiling understands <laughs> the impact that that has. And then the yeah. last thing that we considered currently, our house has um, two by ten floor joists. Uh, we want to go with floor trusses. Floor trusses are made from uh, new growth timber. It's a more sustainable product. Uh, unfortunately, they are quite a bit taller. Uh, Two by ten is basically about uh, nine inches tall. Uh, for the type of house we're going to be building, the floor trusses would be 16 inches. So that's where the additional um, height would come from that takes us to 2.4 feet. Again, 1.4 feet above what the, what the uh, current uh, ordinance specifies for a teardown. And just so I'm clear, the, the February 3, 2011 letter from Joseph Mang. Magner mm -hmm. is the hydrologist, and in that, on the second page of that, he's he notes that the um, that the flood bounce or change in elevation expected in the 100-year precipitation event ex is expected to be 2.4 feet, bringing the level of the pond to 865.4. So that's where you're getting the 2.4. Correct. Okay. Thank you. You don't like fishing from your basement steps? <laughs> <laughs> it's handy, but it's a little messy. Okay. Thank you very much. You. Uh, would anyone else care to speak, speak on this issue? Yes, sir. Hi, uh, my name is Scott Nelson. I live at 4505 Garrison Lane next door to the east of, uh, of Jeff and Connie. We've been their next door neighbors for uh, 18 years. And uh, actually twice during those uh, 18 years, we've had our, our lower level. It's really much more than a basement. It's a fully, just about everyone in that area have, our, this, is a, this is a living area, a living space. It's, it's completely flooded and we're, we're hoping to avoid that this year. But uh, I can certainly uh, understand uh, what they're what they're doing and, and why they why they'd be concerned about this uh, First I'd like to say that we've enthusiastically and unconditionally supported their project since the very start um, Been following this for a year and all the trials and tribulations and the and the hoops that they've jumped through and uh, the hydrologic issues and all of these things and and we are very much supportive of their project and look forward to seeing this house as our as our next-door neighbor um, one of the things I, I think is, is, is you know, the issues are about the uh, floor levels and the hydrology and things, but one of the things that I was really encouraged by was the, the need and the request for the condition that it, it blend in with the context of the neighborhood. Uh, Garrison Lane and St. John's and Ashcroft, the areas around there is a collection of, of uh, Ramblers and my house has a 212 roof pitch. Most of the houses around have maybe 412. There's a lot of hip roofs and and unlike a lot of the houses, the the big new houses and some of the other neighborhoods that are just north and a little west of us on the other side of France, where it's gables on gables, a lot of 12 12 pitches and things that don't fit into those neighborhoods. They've taken great pains from the very start to uh, design something that really fits in. They've had their their house is kind of a prairie style uh, type of project that. I think will fit in really nicely to the, the existing streetscape of Garrison Lane and and will be a little taller than ours but uh, and, and a little taller than the one next door but it'll fit right into the whole of the of the streetscape and I think that's the, the thing that and they started that without without any uh, uh, condition being there they actually I think when this project is done I think the city of Edina could look at it as a as an exemplary addition as an exemplary Tear down. It's actually not a tear down either. They're actually going to move the house. Their house is actually one of the nicer ones in the block. So they're going to take it and actually move it, and somebody else will, will use it uh, somewhere in the southern suburb. So 
I just want to really unequivocally state that we're very supportive of their project, and we really hope that you folks approve it. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Anyone else? Good evening. Uh, my name is Yetta Marks, and I'm at 4508 Garrison Lane. So I'm really the only house that has a full view of the house in question today. I've been at this property for nine years, and I also very strongly support what Connie and Jeff are attempting to do with their property. Um, I, I, as I said, I'm the only one. I have a full view from 90% of my house of their home, so I'm seeing it all in all types of weather, and the type of home that they're pr uh, proposing to put into place here would be consistent with the neighborhood, and whereas they could have built a big two-story home that would have been inconsistent with no problems, they've been having to endure really quite a bit of trials and tribulations over the last year to try and get this approved. And I believe that the house they're proposing is very much in character with the neighborhood and will only do well for my property value selfishly and the others around us when it comes to resale. They've really taken pains to be sure that they are doing this in just the right way so that it does blend with the neighborhood, so that it is envi as environmentally friendly as possible, but to give themselves some actual living space so that they're not cramped in their basements and having to deal with water and the other issues that have presented themselves over the years. Um, our neighborhood has many homes that have mature, long-time residents. Uh, these homes are subject to be for sale in the next couple of years, and I think having a home like theirs in the neighborhood will just help the property value of all of us around them. Um, and lastly, I think I'm just most supportive of their efforts to try and keep this home in the style of the neighborhood. Uh, there are so many homes as I drive through Edina that are being put in small lots that are completely out of place. And this is going to just blend, it will first of all improve my view as I look out of my house across the street and, and blend very nicely with our neighborhood. And I think just overall, um, the option of losing um, Connie and Jeff as neighbors in addition to that would just be devastating to me and I would um, ask that you seriously consider their presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Marks. Yes? <laughs> James Laney and uh, I'm an attorney at 5925 Drew Avenue, South Edina. My parents live next door to um, to the west of the uh, of Connie and Jeff, and uh, and we really don't have a lot of cons. We only they've lived there for f almost 40 years, 39 years. My parents and uh, Connie and Jeff have been there for the last 18, and uh, our only concern was that if we were put in a worse situation than we were before, the only thing we were concerned about was water issues. And basically, with the roof, they're changing their roof line from kind of a north-south to an east-west configuration. And so we just desired that the water from the roof kind of stays on the applicant's property. And we had submitted something to then talk to the city engineer and the city planner. And, you know, they indicated that, you know, they weren't going to have water from their property coming onto our property. And our surveyor had given a suggestion or two in terms of, like, having a swale or having a drainage easement down the um, down the ones down the western side of the property but as long as the city is addressing that and I noticed that uh, Carrie Teague mentioned about the you know coordinating with the city engineers as your third finding and so it was that was our only concern with the project I mean we just didn't want to be uh, negatively impacted as long as that drainage issue is addressed uh, uh, that was our only concern Thank you, Mr. Laney. Other comments? I'm Mike Lynch, uh, 6113 Ashcroft. So I'm about a block away, but I walk my dog past their house every day. So it's very important um, that their house look pretty, and it does. I really, um, uh, the neighbors very articulate, articulated perfectly, I think, what, what uh, you guys need to know. I know that this has been a, a long haul for them. Uh, I was happy to get the letter that I could get here. I know um, um, Connie and Jeff, and it's a great house, uh, 20 years in selling residential real estate. And I can tell you that, again, the neighbor's articulation about the value of their homes 
uh, right on, right on with the design of the house in the neighborhood. And uh, we're, we would be very happy in that neighborhood if you would allow this to happen. Does your dog approve? Pardon me? Does your dog approve? Does, my dog does approve. Okay. <laughs> Just wants to have new lawn to do what it does. <laughs> Okay, uh, yes, sir. I, I might note, uh, just as, a, and I want to make sure that every, every point of view is heard, uh, and, uh, and I don't mean to take away whatever it is you're going to say, but uh, saying the same thing five times, if it was a good thing the first time, doesn't need to be said the extra four. So, uh, but I do want all points of view, you know, make sure you're, you're to everyone, Make sure that your point of view and your comment is heard by you or by somebody. So, yeah, I'm John Parker of uh, 4509 Nancy Lane, and I believe I think we're the only home that can see their property from the south side because we're across the pond from. You're across the lake. Yeah, and um, we're we're just totally in favor of the project, and we're we're looking forward to, you know, you folks approving it. Very Thanks. good. Thank you, Mr. Parker. Other comments. Okay, uh, seeing no other comments, we'll bring this back up here. Uh, comments from the uh, commission. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. So. Um, I am uh, I'm supportive of this and I just wanted to take a second to remind us all of how we got here. You know, the I want to applaud um, the Miller Carinos and their patience in pursuing this. I know it sometimes it seemed uh, extraordinarily bureaucratic, but um, exactly the comments that have been made tonight by the neighbors are the the reason that we went through so much detail in this. The the one foot elevation limitation came out of a concern about McMansions, a concern about people putting too much house on too little lot in neighborhoods where it really changed the character of the neighborhood. And so you had this very challenging issue with water and we were stuck trying to deal with what made common sense as a solution, but also trying to preserve the changes we made to the ordinance to make sure that we were maintaining the character of neighborhoods. And I think tonight is a success in doing that. And I will grant you that maybe it took longer than you wish it had, um, but I think we have arrived at a good place. And so I am, I am supportive of this. I think um, the, the documentation is all there to satisfy uh, our new ordinance. And, um, and the only, I would, I would make a motion that uh, we approve or recommend approval of the conditional use permit um, with the caveat being that we um, note that it satisfies the second of the four elements in addition to uh, element number four and then with the conditions that staff has identified in the staff report. Okay, so a motion's been made that we accept the staff report, we approve the conditional use permit. Um, Second. On the conditions that condition two and four are met plus the additional uh, recommendations and conditions contained in the staff report. There has been a second. Is there further discussion uh, on the motion? I'm just pick up on Commissioner Staunton's comments, just uh, backing up, up just a little bit further even. Um, I think part of what, and actually the, the whole thing that really triggered this very convoluted approach that ultimately brought us to where we are today was the uh, Krumenacher decision that altered our ability to provide variances in the first place. And uh, um, so again, I, 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 I'll reiterate what, what, what Kevin said, which is that uh, you guys have been through a lot and we have, um, I think I'm not speaking for myself, but probably for everybody. We appreciate your patience and in all of our efforts, which probably seems sometimes counterproductive and back and forth, but to get to where we are today, I think this is something that we all wanted to help you accomplish, but there just wasn't a mechanism for a while for us to be able to do that. That's all I have. Other comments? Hearing none, I'll call for a vote on the motion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The uh, motion is passed and you have your uh, approval for your conditional use permit. Uh, 
Pardon me? Is it good? What? It's a recommendation that goes to the council. Is this a recommendation to the council? Okay. We recommend to the council that they approve this. Good luck. It strikes me as fitting that it happens on the eve of what we expect will be, unfortunately, flooding here in the next few days. Okay, speaking of new things, we had a new, uh, a new action under a new ordinance, and now we have another action under a new ordinance. We have our first sketch plan review, this time for 4528 and 4530 France Avenue. Carrie? <clears throat> Thank you, Chair Grable, members of the commission. We're breaking new ground here tonight with all of these new ordinances. Um, the, the purpose of the sketch plan review, as you're um, aware from the code amendment, is for the Planning Commission to discuss, review, and provide informal comment to the comment to the applicant. Uh, the comment should, comments should be considered advisory and shouldn't constitute any binding decision that the Planning Commission uh, would make on the request. This will also go to the City Council along with your comments um, for their sketch plan review uh, to, for additional informal comment. The property is located up in the 44th and France area. There are two properties that we're looking at. Uh, the one property is zone PCD1, kind of our less intense commercial zoning district. There's an existing office building on the site and an existing garage at the back of the site located here. The property up front that's zone PCD4 is the old rapid Valvoline um, <clears throat> oil change station. Um, Again, that property is zone PCD4, which only allows car washes, um, automobile repair, uh, those types of uses. This is another look at the zoning in the area. Again, PCD4, PCD1. The areas in red up here are also planned commercial district one. The orange uh, indicates office zoning. And the white, those are uh, properties zoned R1, low density residential. Property to the south has an R1 zoning, but it's used as an office building. It's an existing non-conforming use on that site. Uh, what the applicant is proposing to do is, tear, is to tear down the existing uh, rapid oil change building, as shown on the screen here. This is the existing office building, and you're seeing the, the uh, rapid oil change building here. Whoop, what happened? Okay. Uh, so, so they're proposing to tear down that, the, uh, the rapid oil change building and build a one-story office building that would match the existing building, um, essentially built behind the, uh, the rapid oil. So the the uh, existing building would be located here. They propose to turn that into a parking lot. This would be the new building uh, located at the back. And then this is the existing building today. They would make a connection between those two buildings. This is a look at the existing site plan. You see the existing structure back here, the existing oil change in the existing office. Again, this is, this is with the new building, with that connection made, and a parking lot out front. The applicant is looking to, they'd like to rezone this to a planned unit development. Again, a new zoning district established with the, the recent code changes. No variances would be needed as part of the PUD. Um, the, the standards that they're proposing would become the standards as part of the PUD if, there's, if this were to be uh, approved. 
The, uh, the zoning ordinance suggests that PUDs should start out with the underlying zoning requirements in mind and what those regulations are. So staff has provided in, the, uh, in your review memo a uh, compliance table that shows th what the PCD1 standards are. And it, it notes that there are a number of standards that wouldn't be met. Uh, first would be along the south lot line here, this back wall. The uh, code standard would be a 30-foot setback to utilize the existing footprint of the, the building that's there today, a two-foot setback would be proposed. Uh, the parking lot in front would require a 10-foot setback uh, from the property line, a green space requirement. Uh, that would be uh, reduced to zero feet, not uncommon in that district up there today. And also in regard to parking stalls, if this entire space were used for retail, 74 stalls would be required and uh, existing on the site would be 53, so they would be slightly short parked. Also, the code requires a screening requirement from R1 properties, and so given the, the two-foot setback at the back of the building, um, it would be difficult to screen uh, that building from residential property. Um, so with that, those are staff's initial uh, comments. Um, I, I would add that What's proposed here this evening would certainly be an improvement on the site. I think Mr. Noonan, the applicant, his work speaks for itself. He's done several um, extremely uh, quality projects throughout the city. The, uh, the uses that are proposed are more compatible um, with the existing uses up there when compared to the, uh, the, the PCD4 zoning that would allow uh, the uh, automotive type uses. But again, staff does have some concerns over the uh, some of those setback requirements. Well, one thing that I didn't mention is this site is located in an area in the comprehensive plan that is um, um, indicated for a potential area of change. And the comprehensive plan says that any development proposal that involves a, uh, a rezoning would require a small area study uh, prior to any planning application or prior to, a, to the rezoning application. The authority to uh, require a small area plan rests with the city council. So um, as part of the sketch plan review, uh, we'd be looking for a little comment as to should a small area plan be done prior to a rezoning here. So that might be something that uh, the commission wishes to weigh in on as well. So with that, I can stand for questions or we could turn it over to the applicant for their presentation. Thank you. Uh, questions for staff? Uh, Carrie, when you talked about uh, the uh, limitations on parking, um, recognizing that either as office or retail, they'll be underparked um, or you know be insufficient space. What are what would be the the impact of that? I mean, where would they where would uh, overflow parking go? Yeah, that, that's the difficult uh, piece of this. If, if this is something that the city would be interested in considering rezoning, I think we would want to require a parking study be done as, as part of the next phase. Um, but overflow would be, you know, if it really becomes a, a tight site that's going to generate more parking than the uses uh, on site there, um, would, gen, gener would tend to uh, flow out onto the street on site or on street parking. Is, I mean, is, this is on France Avenue. Is, are they, is parking on France permitted in that area? You know, I, I don't know the specifics um, okay. where the closest on street parking would be available. Perhaps the applicant might um, shed some light on that. Okay. Other comments, questions? Uh, is someone here from the uh, from Mr. Noonan's organization would like to speak to this? Hi, I'm Ed Noonan, uh, 84 Woodland Circle, Dinah. Also, Scott Newland, our architect, actually designed the first building with us, with us on that site. Is here to answer questions and join us too. I can give you a little bit of history on the building there. 
what led me to that building here probably 12 years ago. We um, were over by the Jerry's Food Building, and we had the eminent domain come in with that development of the Lewis property there. We were taken, had to find a property quickly to relocate to. We found this site here available. It was owned by the Gold family, Dick Gold from Edina here. He owned the classic motor car, Moby Dicks, in the gay 90s and did his car restorations down in this parking garage that was down there about 9,500 square feet. They also had a, we called it a um, gay 90s 2 salon down there. It's where they met and did some staff development meetings down there and employment contracts were written, I think, in after hour celebrations. So that's what we acquired when we had that. We stripped the bar out of that facility took the hoists out, the air compressors they used to restore their cars. He was all 1900 to 1920 vintage, and he displayed many of those cars, as you may know, if you remember classic motor car on Excelsior Boulevard. Uh, we were required by the city back then to put in a pretty extensive retaining wall to meet the watershed district's concerns with the flow down the driveway there and the erosion that was happening. We had pricing done in that around thirty-five dollars to $40,000. I felt for that kind of price, we could put a sizable foundation in on that site and chose to build the building here as a phase one uh, project there. And that was a building that came up there, the new brick and stucco building. We asked Scott, our architect here, to take and really blend it into that neighborhood, the Morningside area, what we would see with the other type of buildings in that area. I thought he did a great job with that. We did not have control of the Valvoline site our long-term goal was to control that. Here we were on the side of it and wrapped around the back of that site there. Um, they were kind of in the final stages of business there. They found that that type of a facility wasn't large enough to justify uh, the corporate owning that. So when they sold to us here, it was under the stipulation that we could do anything with it as long as it met the city code, uh, car wash, automobile maintenance, but we couldn't do more than 15 oil changes a day. In essence, we couldn't compete with them, but they encouraged us to do automotive re restoration and care there. That isn't my business. I've had a lot of people come and want that space to put our you know, automotive center back into it or even a drive-through car wash there. To me, it doesn't feel appropriate at that neighborhood to do something like that. And uh, we had Scott, who I'll introduce now, drop the plans here for the property. And I'll be off to the site to answer questions if you have them too. Scott Newland. <coughs> Thank you again. I'm Scott Newland from Newland Architecture. Um, as Ed said, um, I assisted in the design of the um, original building that was built 10 years ago. And an attempt was made to um, blend that in aesthetically with the rest of the neighborhood. And of course, what we're planning to do, or proposing to do, is to continue that same aesthetic, essentially unifying and strengthening the image of the overall site. Um, it's a very tight site, as you know, and the building right now is a non-conforming use. So that's what we're trying to attempt to go around and study. Thank you. I, I have uh, at least one question. The building that is proposed, see, I'm not, <clears throat> I haven't looked at that site. So mm -hmm. that, there's a garage underneath, is that correct? It's essentially at the same level as existing um, Valvoline oil change building's floor. So essentially the grade continues as the roof of the parking garage. Okay. You can't see it from France Avenue. Will that continue to be a parking garage, or is that going to be? Yes, it will. In fact, that has been taken into account as far as the parking study. Okay. The intent is to um, use the, essentially the roof, strengthen the roof, make it the floor of the proposed new work, and then build on top of that. And have the parking underneath. That's right. How do you access that parking ramp? Along the north side of the existing building. Okay. Sorry, we didn't bring PowerPoint, but there's an existing driveway that comes on the north side that goes downhill, of course, into the garage. Oh, there? Okay, I see. I was having trouble orienting myself to the pictures that were provided and, uh, and to that. Thank you very much. Other uh, questions uh, of the Commission? Commissioner Carp? Just to follow up on the parking, uh, so I make sure that I'm not confused. The uh, information that's in our packet uh, indicates a, a shortfall in the parking amount in terms of what would be expected for that site. Uh, is the, what you're talking about relative to the ramp, does that correct that or does that take that into account already? Relative to the parking garage, you mean? Yeah. 
It takes that into account. We have obviously a very limited number of stalls we can get on the surface outside the building. The rest would have to be within the parking garage itself. Okay. But that – and that – the combination of what would be on – on the – in the ramp and on surface parking would be the – is it the 53 stalls that you – that's the total? That's correct. Okay. I have a question on the parking. You know, you have the lower level, and as you have it parked now, for your total, that's – I don't know what percent, maybe a third of it is underneath there. And that area is a pretty big parking crunch with everything across the street as well. So how would you intend to encourage people to use that garage? Is that for employees or is it for the public? Or what was your intent on that piece? I'll let Ed answer that to some extent. But I do want to point out that the actual parking count would be more like 58. And it's about half and half. We have about 27 or 28 available on the exterior, about 31 inside. The lower garage right now is used for storage of cars, but also mainly for the staff of the Compass Games Corporation that's in that building that we built there, the two stories. They've got about just under 4,000 square feet there. And they've got assigned stalls in the parking garage openers or drive over court to get in and out of that garage. That would be the intent. It wouldn't be for the public coming and going traffic. It would be for the staff of the property. I notice when we look at the city standard in the chart that's provided, we're looking at both the standard for parking stalls for office space and what the standard would be for retail space. What's your, I mean, I know it's clairvoyance and everything else, but looking forward, what do you see as the primary use of all elements of this new building that you're proposing? Well, the connection of the building, it was shown on the drawing here, started because the current tenant has been there just under five years and wants to renew with the chance of growing their business. And they want to do it on that site. Their two main clients is Best Buy and Target. And they want to be in the middle of the two locations, which this is, also very close to the airport for their corporate clients that come in and out of town. They do a lot of their entertaining at 50th and France, the restaurants up there. So they really like this site. This is very desirable for them. They want to stay here. But they said, we could outgrow this here. And they knew that we had plans or thoughts of this right here. So that's what was kind of leading this process here. We're frightened to death of this wall area study plan, to be honest with you. We have nobody, I'm not ready to, you know, lead a crusade. It hasn't been done really yet. And that's kind of what we got talking with Kerry here. What would be another approach here? And we appreciate your time trying to just entertaining this thought here because we don't know what's ahead of us for it. So it would be primarily office space? Correct. Okay. Thank you. I certainly appreciate the architectural character that's been established with the existing building and also your desire not to bring in another automotive business where rapid oil change was. The thing I'm struggling with is that front parking lot and how here's a chance to build a new building up to, say, a zero lot line in the character of the France 44 area older buildings or at a minimum get some landscaping in to meet some of the PUD goals and make it more pedestrian friendly. Have you looked at a way to accomplish that? Okay, that's interesting. That's the same conversation we had about eight, nine years ago when this building was built. They encouraged us to come all the way up to the front property line, but, again, it was the parking that was at risk here. Earlier in discussion here, there was a question, where else can they park? This, remember, is Minneapolis on the opposite side of France Avenue, kind of split down the middle there. There is parking along the curb line all the way up France on that side and continuing past us. So that would pick up some of the overflow also. It's a very difficult area up there, Morningside. It's a wonderful community, but parking, you look at the Brugger's, a coffee shop, even Dick's Barber, you know, parking is very minimum up there. You've got a little bit of relief from the street parking, some with, I think, Convention Grill, Woodshop of Avon. They've got some extra lots that I think are sometimes utilized for parking. But for us, we feel that this here is an attempt to bring parking in there that doesn't exist now. Green space, we love green space. As we did our brownstone project there, it was brought to our attention. We had too many 
extra parking stalls, we want to see more green space, put more trees in. We went one and a half times that factor with our green space. So I do have a real respect for that. I live in the community here. We own other property in the community. 90% uh, of my business is in, within the Edina community. So I take great pride in what we do and put our name on. Uh, we tried to add some green space here. We try to supplement that with other pots and things like that too. Um, but I just can't see bringing a building all the way up to zero property line here, and especially with the topography there, trying to meet any type of parking. Um, it's an extremely wooded lot behind there. It's kind of the watershed drainage area back there, a little bit of a retention holding pond, if you were to walk in the back of the building there. If you were to look from the residential homes across there with the size of the mature trees there, even with the second story on here, which would be about the same height as the back of the Rapid Oil building, uh, they see a couple of the red bullseyes that were trademarks of the old Rapid Oil. They say we can barely see that when the leaves have even leafed out. Well, that wouldn't be gone, obviously, with this new building here. Um, so just some thoughts. Any comments? Sure. Sorry. Um, with respect to the surface parking, can you talk a little bit about the challenges in terms of how that was designed in terms of the the parking spaces that are at least indicated on the plan. It looks to me like they kind of go in, in different directions. It just it's, it looks a little, um, I don't know, confusing perhaps. Sure. What we're trying to do there is right now currently there's four curb cuts to France Avenue, and we're trying to cut back on that. So we went down to three curb cuts. Uh, a lot of it, I think, you know, Scott was our goal is maximize parking, meet the handicap requirements. Uh, you got trash retention, you know, things like that to screen. Um, is that not our goal with what we came up with here? Yeah, of course. But as far I think your um, question is about the flow through the parking lot as well. Yeah, it is partially. I, I noticed, for example, if you go in to that, you know, um, into the middle, the middle curb cut, mm -hmm. um, you basically have uh, eliminated uh, any of the parking to the north of the. Uh, of that space, then you need to come in on the north end and come, and then and turn left to come in there based upon the the stall uh, design. And I gather that design is, is slanted that way because there isn't enough space to um, to have them perpendicular to the walk. That's correct. I should also point out that that uh, northern parcel with the one-way uh, traffic coming through it is an existing condition. I mean, that's what's there right now, and sure. because of the limited space and the diagonal parking. There were a few alternates available to us. You you refer to some of those stalls being compact, seven and a half feet wide. How many are there of those? Um, actually, less than we're allowed to do. I mean, we're allowed to do more than that. I think there's only the um, two. All the rest are designed as full-size stalls. Did you consider getting rid of another of the curb cuts there to help your parking maybe? I don't know if it would help the parking. And it just seems on that street too with all those curb cuts along there onto France, is it is it giving too many opportunities for traffic in there and people pulling out something something to consider? At, yeah, at this point we haven't looked at any less than three. I think um, uh, it's, it's a reasonable number. Again, we are dropping off one that there are four now. Um, we also want to make it easy to get in and out of, and as was just pointed out, um, there's just the one way to the, the north park. I mean, so we, don't, we can't allow that to enter into the full circulation pattern. You have to go back onto France. So the remaining two, I think, are essential. And Nancy, going back to your question earlier here on what we would see in this property here, you know, I've been approached even when the Compass Game Building here used to be the Shiraz Rug Company, if you remember seeing that I name do. up there for many years. And, um, it wasn't a real highly uh, vehicle used property, and that's what we're looking for there. I've got across the street for the um, hair salon, uh, the, the uh, nail salon, and also the, the cost cutters or the hair place over there want to get to the Edina side of the street here. And I say it will never be a tenant in our building. We maintain manager owned property here. It's not something we're going to take and build and sell. We retain our property, and you know I wouldn't let something like that happen as I would with any property that we own. Uh, okay. Thanks, Ed. As I, as I understand it, the, the, I think I heard you say that the current proposal would be that the people who are already in the existing building would expand into the new building. 
that's an indication they have shared with me. Now, whether they would take, as per diagram here, just extend behind them with that 1,900 feet that's being studied still by their internal department, or I said they could take and wait until we had the structure up and they could take the 6,000 square feet to the left of that, then we'd release this building out. Okay. But would you propose that all the buildings are in office space as opposed to retail? I would think it would be appropriate. You know, we want to respect the clients that we have there and keep it consistent. I don't see it being a coffee shop. I would never be back here asking you for permission for that, though we were approached many times by Starbucks. No drive-thrus. Pardon me? No drive-thrus. Yes, exactly, yeah. So I would see it being office. You know, if it's an office condo design, which we see around town, possibly, but I think it would be just strictly more of a straightforward office space. One of the issues that's been raised is you're not going to change from the existing – you're going to use the existing garage building as the foundation for the new building. So you're not going to expand beyond what's already there in terms of width, but you will because of height. Speak to the impact of where you're right along that back property line on that one diagonal. Are you referring to just the fact that we're extruding up the base and what that impact might be? Yep. Right there. Well, I was more concerned about the small diagonal that seems to be right along the property line there. Is that – you know, what's that going to look like? I think if you look at the depth of these houses to the rear of their property line, the ones at front on 44th there, it's a quite long point, plus it's an extremely wooded area back there. It's a very short wall that also is there because right away the diagonal comes in from the parking garage. So if it's a home that abut at 44th, that's your only abutment there if that's what you're asking. Okay. And that length of wall is – did I mention Scott? It's a 27-foot wall. Yeah, all the backyards in that area, for what it's worth, are extra deep, and they're all landscaped heavily with existing woods, but that's just a mitigating factor. It's right up against R1. Chair? Do you foresee any constructability issues with that back there as far as getting access to the residential? Would you need to go on their property to construct this structure as far as the back wall and any – you know, if you need any foundation improvements or anything in that area? I don't – that's a fair question. I don't foresee the need offhand for any supplemental footing work back there. We did some reinforcement to the existing building originally. I think most of the construction can be accessed from the east side on the property itself, but Ed might know better on that one. Yeah, except for probably about an 8-foot right away just for stuccoing the back wall. I mean, everything can be pre-built and stood up here, but the final stuccoing would have to be scaffolded up from the back side. My final parking question. You mentioned needing to strengthen the current roof of the parking garage to build the office space on top. Have you considered parking a second level on top with, say, concrete plank to, again, looking for ways to get that parking around the back of a zero lot line? Sure, and then eliminate some of the square footage of the office. Is that what you're thinking? I don't know if you would need to. That would be up to Scott, I guess. But it would eliminate the height of the back wall. You would be screening a parking area instead of a full second story and kind of surrounding, I think, the existing building coming out to the front. And then that would get you down to two curb cuts. I don't think it extends into part of the building. I'm just maybe not making it clear. This is a 15-foot drop here. Are you aware of that? Yes. On these two sides? Okay. So your concept would be to come in here and park around the back and come out? No, I come in the south side of the lot. Okay. Along the side of a building built out to the front and then park on top of the – Here, pull to the front and park back there. Essentially flip the position of the parking in the building. Yes. 
My understanding, of course, this, this sketch plan review is something new for us, too, and that's something we hadn't, frankly, thought about. Obviously, it has some concerns about additional construction costs, leakage issues, all those things, but um, it's a point well taken. We hadn't looked at that yet. I was just sharing with Scott that we're about 9,9500 square feet with a, a building back here, and this front looks like it's pretty close to about the same. So uh, would we just be exchanging and adding additional costs? I've got a foundation in and a floor system in here I can build on top of. Here I would excavate out a foundation, floor system, roof system, and then... No, 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 addi no additional excavation but just to put concrete plank on top of that existing garage. Sure, so back here, but then we're building our new building up here, correct? On grade, or do you have two okay. levels? So it's still the new foundation, floor system, roof system? Yes. Here it would be yes. just walls and roof? Yeah. Yeah, I, I have no idea how that is going to impact a pro forma financially, yeah. but want to I love help projects, the idea. but uh, I think money-wise we can see, but it's creative. Um, Ed, you mentioned, um, I think, scared to death was the phrase that you used on the small area plan. Um, I do think we have to think about if we're going to do rezoning and or changes to the comprehensive plan. At least some of us who sit up here have had experience with doing that without um, making sure that we've got everybody in the neighborhood um, on board with that notion. If it's not a small area plan, do you have ideas for how we might reach out and incorporate um, the folks in that neighborhood to make sure we're kind of heading in a direction that's consistent with their vision for the future of that area? Well, that area to me, I think, you know, Kevin, is a very active area. It's with the Sunnyside or the 44th. They've got a, a pretty strong neighborhood group in that area. Um, I don't know, and that's why we came to uh, here also was, what do we do with this here? How do we bring it, you know, short of putting up a sign on France Avenue and just having them call and come visit us, you know. Uh, we had it down at the Brownstones, you know, we had a lot of neighborhood concern and support both ways. Uh, not much down on our Valleywood project because that wasn't a rezoning down there. Um, yeah, we had all the controversy before you came in. <laughs> yes, very true, yes. Uh -huh. So we were pleased to see you come in at the end. Yeah, okay. I, I just think that's, I mean, you do great work, and people have really liked the stuff you've done, and this looks like a nice idea, whether it's up against the curb or not, and how that all flows. I mean, that is exactly what we're trying to do with Sketch Plan, is have these kinds of conversations before mm -hmm. everybody's sunk a lot of time and money into it. But um, I do think this is a real we really have to kind of take this small area plan issue head on. We have to figure out a way to address what the comprehensive plan is really saying is if we're going to do a zoning change that we've, we've got to kind of consider that whole area in some way. Um, we're, we're undergoing one right now in the Grandview district. And um, while that has been a good process, I understand that, you know, you don't want to wait two years to, to do this. Um, and I think the council is sensitive to that too, but I, I just think that's the, in my mind, that's the big barrier here is how do we deal with that portion of the comprehensive plan that says in this, you know, area of likely change that we need to be doing a small area plan before we proceed. And maybe there's a different way to do it that isn't exactly a small area plan, or maybe there are different flavors of small area plan. Um, but we have to figure out a way to engage that that um, portion of the community. Sure. And as we looked up the definition of a small area plan, it really wasn't defined well to us. Length of time and really truthfully the cost of it. What it could impact us going into a project like this here that we can spend up front. Uh, you know, we've got a site next to us here, the historic Edina Cleaners site here, a heavily contaminated site that we've done our borings and we're clean where we are uh, and to the south of us here. So it's a difficult, you know, thing to look at here. I've been offered the next two buildings to the south also, but I don't see any value that would substantiate the investment cost to acquire those. 
to work goes into this property here. And, um, you know, maybe at the end of the day, we just take and put it back into a garage, let somebody rent it out and have cars there again. It's not my goal. It's not what we do. But, uh, you know, right now I'm putting a couple of my company trucks in there at night, which I could keep at my current office. Uh, just to keep vandalism and things down from seeing the building being active, you know, some in and outs there during the day. So um, I, I really look for your guidance on this here, you know. Carrie, um, is this a, um, this sketch plan process being new to us as well, is it contemplated that it goes on to the council as well? It would go to the council, okay. yes. So that's certainly, you know, I think you're going to find that the council is going to be trying to wrestle with this same issue. And I'm not saying there's an easy answer to it. I, I just think that's the biggest dilemma in my mind anyway. Okay. Well, I appreciate your comments shared tonight here. I mean, the parking that came up here, the type of usage for the building that came up here, the movement of the building front or back things. I always welcome these type of discussions, you know, and uh, we see things from a certain viewpoint or disadvantage point maybe at times here. And uh, just looking at what the property was to what it could be today here. And uh, it gets more and more challenging as a developer here, A, to get funds, as you know, and B, to get approvals to do things that we seem to want to do. So it's, uh, we're just, that's why we came here. I appreciate this opportunity tonight here. And uh, whether we go the next step to council or not, it's a discussion that we could have, you know, with your blessings or, you know, carry here and ourselves too. What would you do if you were me? Chair, I guess one, one suggestion moving forward, um, again referring to the, the goals of the PUD, is to try and pick off as many of those as you can to present, you know, that come along with this project, the, the walkability, stormwater management. You know, you, you touched on several of them. Mm -hmm. But I think you, there are probably more on this list that you could emphasize the positive aspects of. Okay. Other comments? Yes. I just say one thing, and you mentioned it a little bit before the, the neighborhood association is fairly very strong there, and having that involvement early on, I think, would be a key here. You know, as your as your program goes forward and what you're planning and uh, engaging that um, before it can turn on you in different ways. Yeah. So. I agree, Michael. After 36 years of building, it's, it can work as a double-edged sword, you know. And what color are you choosing? And which brick is it again? And, you know, it can get carried away, too. That's what we're afraid of. This can get really lengthened out here. And you did a great job with the previous, you know, group that was in here. And God bless them for a year or whatever time that you spent and they spent on working through this. You guys are put in a very difficult position, you know. We appreciate that. And, uh, Again, like I said, with the small area study here, I, I can't say what's been done like this. This is how long it took, and this is what it costs. It's, I mean, if I'm not mistaken, aren't you working with a grant through the Grandview one, a governmental grant or something that helped with that cost a little bit? Yeah, and and I, I don't know that necessarily a small area plan is is contemplated to, you know, be on the developer's dime. I, I mean, I, I think it's just, like you said, small area plan isn't really defined. We've got one way that we're doing it for the Grandview District. That doesn't mean it has to be the same for the next area. But the comprehensive plan identifies it as an area where we've got to do some of that. And I, I think what it's saying in the big picture is you just kind of have to look beyond the individual site and say, okay, how's this going to impact what we're doing with this whole area? And I know historically there's been some sensitivity with what the future of the that kind of 44th in France area is, and, and folks in that neighborhood are going to want to engage on that to the extent what you're proposing is going to impact that future. Yeah. And I think this is a good stage of the game to talk about that because you haven't, you know, because of our sketch plan review, you can kind of have some ideas here, but you haven't gone through all kinds of time and expense to really, um, where you're kind of stuck in a place where you can't change. And I also don't know, too, with the um, neighboring Minneapolis side, how that would affect us through this. Right. You know, if that hasn't been challenged yet either. It's a very good question. Ideally, what would your time frame be for this? Uh, within a 12-month period, be able to break ground. Okay. By the time you get financing lined up here, I would try to get them under uh, a new lease agreement, too, 
where I know the bank's going to require now 70, 75 percent solid leases, wow. five to ten year leases with personal guarantees. It's not easy to come by today. Mm -hmm. So it takes some time to do that. You know, you just mentioned an interesting point. There is a challenge at, at 50th and 44th where we are bisecting the city and, and Edina. Um, you might have heard some of the discussions we've had lately about, and the council has had about parking in the 50th and France area. If we look at oh my goodness, the yes, you know yes. incursion of more and more restaurants, wonderful for our community, mm -hmm. but uh, Edina seems to be providing the parking for all of those. So that, that right. becomes I felt, a challenge. I felt so bad as you say, Nancy, seeing the um, belaying that's necessary to not even removing the snow off the curb line right. to make it more friendly for the businesses there. I mean, it's tough. I mean, we love the restaurants too. Our Brownstone's clients, and my God, we got 12 to 15 restaurants within a block and a half. Why cook at home anymore? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's great to have, and it's really revitalized that area. But that is one of the consequences. And I keep thinking, where can we park? Can we park at the post office? Can we add more layers on top of? What would Jack Rice say if we did something over there? Or the post office. <laughs> yes, uh -huh. And that, that'll be interesting in a small area plan at, at 44th as well. Yeah. yeah. It's the same same issue. Jeff? I'm just going to go on, on a limb a little bit here because I, I know that that's part of what we're supposed to do with respect to this. And it's easy to do when it's not my money. But <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, when I think about the things that we've talked about on, on the commission, we've talked with the city council about uh, in terms of of what we what seems to work in this community, maybe what doesn't. Uh, there's um, and reflecting on what's in the comp plan right now about trying to make things more pedestrian friendly. Um, I think the idea of of possibly pushing the building more to the street and pushing the parking behind it, if that was possible, I think that would be a more attractive option. I know it's not really interesting financially, but. Um, that, I think, would be something that would be uh, a more desirable scenario in terms of what I think we might want to see. Um, you know, and some of that, that design is already kind of inherent in that community already. Um, I know that. And if there are ways that we can try to facilitate that as, as what I suspect, if we did a small area plan, that might be kind of what people might envision would be something, you know, the, a more cocooned version of the 50th and France environment. That, that's kind of what I think might be what, what we might be looking more towards. Okay. Other comments? I, I, uh, I appreciate the fact that you are, try, are trying this process out with us uh, as we're kind of feeling our way too. Um, just a couple points. I think, you know, you raised the point about the fact that it's Minneapolis across the street, and while we can control what happens on the west side of France, we don't have much control about what happens on the east side of France. Uh, and, I, and I think we as a planning commission and the city council has to take that into account as far as what gets developed on our side of France Avenue. Uh, another point, you know, the perfect can be the enemy of the good, and uh, you can't, the perfect is the enemy of the good. You can't demand a perfect project that meets everybody's final wishes and not have a good project because of that. And you look at the alternative on a site like this, uh, this proposal I think is certainly much preferable to uh, a rapid oil change in the neighborhood. And I would imagine that most of the neighbors uh, would agree with that statement. I don't live there, so I can't speak for them, but it just seems to me that uh, this is a worthy project, I think, to consider. There's some opportunities here to enhance what's going on in France Avenue. There's some opportunities to enhance what's going on in the neighborhood. And, uh, you know, you asked what would, I, what, would, what would we do if it was me and my money. I'd, I'd take my sketch plan to the city council and I'd try and move this project along because I think it's uh, it's the kind of redevelopment that the city of, I the city of Edina needs to uh, needs to consider. So just well, I appreciate the comments that were shared here and uh, we've worked together on many projects here through over the years here and 
you know, many of you members here of the commission, you're a few new faces to it. You know, we go way back, Jeff. I mean, when I used to bring things to you uh, back 10, 15 years ago, it seems like. Um, and we'll take it all to heart here, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And Carrie, you've been wonderful to work with here, you know, and a great addition to our community here, to have somebody heading our, you know, planning division like this here. You guys, we've got a great team here. Now it's making it work, and uh, I'll continue to think about the 44th. I know some of the council members, we've worked with them before. I know it's a, it's a different ball there altogether, too. And let's see what the pulse is on it, you know, take it to that level and get some feedback, and uh, you'll be able to see as we do that. And, uh, Thank you. I do want, uh, Commissioner Stone. I was just going to ask, um, Mr. Chair, whether, how, what do we do with this small area of plan? Is it just the comments that we've given and then those are just kind of taken by the applicant and then it moves to the next stage and the council members can well, take a look? But maybe that's where you were going, Mr. Chair. I was, I was heading that direction. <laughs> uh, I do want to know if there's anybody, uh, there are some additional people in the audience. I want, want to know if anybody uh, here, member of the public, wishes to comment on this as long as we are discussing this. It's appropriate, I think, to hear uh, what anybody else might have to say. Uh, okay. <laughs> it's, it's not that we have a huge audience here, but there are some people out there that might like to talk. Apparently, there are no more comments. I was going to ask the same question. Uh, Plan uh, is this something that is it appropriate for the for the commission to recommend that this go on to the council, or is it just does it happen automatically, or how would you foresee something like that? The uh, the code specifically states that sketch plans are reviewed both by planning commission and city council. So if if I guess two options, if um, based on the comments here tonight, Mr. Noonan could say, I don't want to move forward to the city council, and then it's done. But if he is still interested, and in that, that's the, the feeling that I'm hearing this evening, that we would take it to the city council for their comments. Ultimately, that decision about the small area plan rests with the city council. That is their, um, it's their prerogative whether to require that or not. But I, I think your comments tonight would all be forwarded um, along with the sketch plan. appreciate your time you. and your, your efforts here. Uh, I would like to bring this back up to the commission to see if there are any additional comments or thoughts that any of the members of the body have uh, with respect to this. And then I think it would be appropriate for the commission to uh, take some action acknowledging the fact that we had the discussion today and we had considered the small area, the sketch plan, uh, that we reviewed it. Uh, and that the record as reflected in what we've talked about today be passed on to the city council for whatever uh, the council wants to do with it. I think we should have some formal acknowledgement that we did this today. So other comments, concerns, questions from the commission? Commissioner Shearer. The only comment I'm making, and well, I absolutely understand our obligation to the comprehensive plan and the points that it makes. Um, it, it is striking me, as, and, and this is very off the cuff as we entertain this uh, uh, discussion this evening, that we can't run multiple small area plans simultaneously, I don't believe, and, and do really a top-notch job of getting the right input uh, and bringing those to appropriate closure. And simultaneously, we are not as a practical matter, going to be able to, uh, nor should we, in my opinion, um, halt all other development that might be coming forward in the community. So there's an interesting balancing act here. Uh, and I'm hoping the uh, council will take that into consideration. Uh, it's, it's not easy to make this a pure black and white discussion uh, in terms of what the comprehensive plan attempts to do and, and will try to do whenever possible. You know, picking, picking up on that a little bit, there's a couple things that occur to me. Um, one, the idea of going to the uh, uh, community and, and, uh, and presenting it to the neighborhood would be along, you know, in conjunction with the comments, the sketch plan comments that we provide and the sketch plan comments that the uh, council might provide, 
sort of has maybe a little bit of a flavor of a small area plan. And so in the context of perhaps not, if there's a decision made not to go forward with one, the combination of those various ingredients might provide something similar to that that might be helpful guidance. And the only other comment I was going to make, and it relates a little bit to the conversations we've had about the comp plan in the past with respect to some of the designs we've seen. And that's, you know, one of the overriding themes in there, at least in part, is this idea of having more of a walkability environment and, you know, with designs that I've always sort of interpreted in my time, my limited time on the commission has been, you know, more of a replication of what we've seen with 50th and France. Sometimes we seem to pay more lip service to it than actually implementation of it. And, you know, I think that it would be useful for us to move in the direction of looking to the comp plan as more affirmative guidance on some of those issues than perhaps we sometimes pay to it. I just have a comment. I live in the neighborhood there, and this is the rapid oil change. I've always wondered how it was ever there. So I think it's a great thing that somebody is looking at addressing or some other piece to there. And where it goes, I don't know, but I would certainly encourage to keep going on it. I think the neighborhood in general would much rather have something than the rapid oil change center there. Other comments? I would entertain a motion that we recognize that we've conducted a, we've had a sketch plan discussion this evening on this topic, that we've had comments from various members of the commission, that we've asked questions and received answers from the proponent, and that we formally pass this on for further consideration by the city council. So moved. Second. Is there further discussion of the motion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. This matter will be passed on to the city council, and we wish you good luck as you proceed. You're welcome. Next item on the agenda, consideration of zoning ordinance amendments concerning rooftop dining, side yard setback, the Zoning Board of Appeals, and small wind and solar renewable energy systems. Kerry, do you have any comments? Wish to kick off the discussion on these, please? Certainly, Chair Grable. Members of the commission, we'll start with the rooftop dining. Based on the direction from the Planning Commission at our last meeting, February 23rd, staff has revised the ordinance that will allow rooftop dining as a conditionally permitted use in our PCD2 districts. That's generally the Grandview area, 50th and France area, and the Edina Interchange, just off Highway 100 and 77th. The changes include requiring a 50-foot setback to R1 and R2 properties. The previous document talked about a 50-foot setback from residential uses. Also, we've included a screening requirement from R1 and R2 properties, and also that speakers be allowed but cannot be audible from adjacent properties. So given that, to summarize the ordinance in front of you, the conditions that are required for somebody to do rooftop dining, first, the use has to be accessory to an indoor restaurant in that same building. Rooftop dining may not have a kitchen facility or a bar on the roof. The rooftop dining, over 20% of the principal indoor restaurant must provide additional parking spaces. It ties back to our discussion of the 50th and France area. Again, the 50-foot setback requirement from the R1 and R2 properties. 
hours would be limited from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. And there's a provision that uh, we could potentially uh, tweak those a little bit more depending on the circumstance. Again, ampl amplified sound may not be audible from adjacent properties and that screening is required from the R1 and R2 uh, uh, district. So with that, if the Planning Commission is comfortable with this language, we could uh, forward that on to the City Council for their consideration, or if there's something that we've missed or we want to continue discussion, we could do that as well. So with that, I'll turn it over to the Commission for discussion. Thank you, Planner Teague. Uh, comments, thoughts from the members of the Commission? Thank you. Um, my initial reaction is that the, uh, the text of the uh, ordinance as drafted right now reflects what we've discussed and but for one item or one general item, I, I was going to recommend that we uh, adopt this. But I uh, included in the packet was a, uh, uh, an email that I think was forwarded to the uh, Planning Commission uh, via uh, Council Member Bennett regarding a uh, uh, information that was furnished, I think including it looks like a, a form of uh, ordinance that was used uh, in another municipality outside the state of Minnesota, I believe, that I thought, I, I thought was actually somewhat informative and raised some thoughts that may be different than what uh, we've done. And I wonder if, if we should at least consider the possibility of incorporating some of that. And I'll just use as an example. Um, and of course, this ordinance was drafted differently. The structure of the ordinance is different. But um, they've included, uh, in terms of other activities that can take place on the rooftop, uh, were you know, private catered or special events, wedding receptions, business receptions, things that perhaps would be just as appropriate on the rooftop that perhaps doesn't fall within the category of uh, quote, rooftop dining. I wonder if there is some value in expanding that definition to incorporate a little bit more breadth of use as one thought. Um, I had uh, another thought uh, that uh, I don't think it was, maybe it was or it wasn't reflected in that other ordinance, but uh, the idea of whether or not we have any lighting restrictions or requirements for what uh, exists on the rooftop I don't think it's contained in the ordinance, but maybe it's it's reflected elsewhere in the city ordinances. In terms of lighting, right, it would be subject to our our general lighting regulations citywide. And what would the, those lighting regulations be in terms of what would exist on a rooftop? It, it's the amount of foot candles um, that would spill onto adjacent properties, and it varies depending on if it's adjacent to residential. Um, can't be as bright if it's adjacent to commercials. Com uh, commercial property can be a little brighter. Okay, so that's covered then. That is. Like. Okay. Carrie, does that require cutout lighting, or um, excuse me, cutoff lighting in the ordinance that as exists today? Um, yeah, any lighting has. The exposed portion of a light can't be directed at adjacent property, okay. so it has to be a shoebox type lighting. Um, one of the things I noticed, I think it's a Milwaukee uh, right. document that we were looking at. Uh, there was an, uh, a section that talked about appropriate security measures being in place. and. I don't, I don't know what our current practice is with commercial buildings, but it does strike me that on a rooftop, um, we're a little silent about fencing or uh, security issues in terms of uh, potential danger to clients. And, and I wonder what the other commissioner's thoughts are on that, whether we should have something included that expresses our expectations. I was also thinking about that because in the ordinances there's nothing about safety of like because little kids like sometimes are up there and like their parents aren't watching and it's on the roof and there should be something about safety. Uh, 
Other thoughts? Chair? Yep. A question for Carrie, I guess, other than the, the typical life safety guardrail rules. Is there any other, anything beyond that in terms of safety issues in the code? Um, yeah, that would be covered by the building code. I don't know what that is for how tall a fence or some type of a guardrail would be required. I don't know what that height would be, but that's where that provision would be, would be covered in the, the under the building code. So you're saying that it already exists, though? It would, yeah. Okay. But that, but it, it's a point well taken. That might be something that we would want to um, include here so it's known up front. Other comments? Yes. I was just wondering if anybody else on the commission has any reaction to the idea of expanding the definition for um, for outdoor dining to include other types of special events, or, or if there's a sense as to whether it's even necessary. I personally wouldn't think that it's precluded specifically by our ordinance. Do you? Well, I mean, as long as you meet the other criteria of no bar present and. I mean, it's referred as rooftop dining, um, and I don't think it's just outdoor dining on a rooftop. I, mean, I, it, I interpret it to be a much, much more of a, a strictly re, uh, restaurant atmosphere, which is, I think, kind of what we were talking about and thinking about when we were drafting this to begin with. I never really thought about other types of uses that might be okay. somewhat similar to that. So, so you're thinking that ours is written more with an idea towards tables and people sitting down as opposed to a reception? Kind of thing, or people milling about. I think so. But okay. I'm could could we accomplish that by just changing the title to commercial rooftop use or something like that? If, I'm trying to think of what that would be, other than a, a reception, a, a landscape company wants to display plants on a roof or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Hard to speculate. Well, I, I, I'm building off of what was uh, done in Milwaukee. Milwaukee. Um, yeah. I mean they. They, I think, kind of captured what I sort of envision might be the types of uses that, um, you know, outdoor roof activities in conjunction with public or private catered and special events such as wedding receptions, business receptions, catered events, or special parties seems to be, uh, and I, they don't for some reason add in here rooftop dining, <laughs> but um, unless I'm missing it, but it means if you had rooftop dining and perhaps some description of these other types of events that might be very similar, if not identical to this, we might capture more, a little more broadly and maybe more accurately the types of uses that people might actually intend. I'm thinking, for example, a restaurant that you know may have rooftop uh, dining as part of what they're, they're trying to accomplish, but um, may have other special events for certain evenings where they'd perhaps like to close down the rooftop dining and, and have some other kind of event if somebody wants to rent out the, rent out the roof. Um, it's an interesting thought. My, my, my thought on that just off the top of my head is that that goes beyond, I mean, there was, obviously there was some controversy from some of the people in the neighborhood to rooftop, rooftop dining at all. Uh, receptions and parties and that type of thing, I think in that context is different than or different from um, a, a restaurant operation on a roof. And I'm just not sure that mm -hmm. it seems to me that it, that makes it a different ordinance. And I'm not saying it's no, that's not a good thing. I agree. This, it does make a difference. We ought to think about it. It does make a difference in how it might be perceived by the uh, by the community. However, heretofore we've talked about dining as opposed to catering and, and that type of thing. So, Mr. Stone, it, it does sound as we're talking about this that maybe a definition of rooftop dining might be, or whatever it is we're going to permit, might be appropriate. Um, you know, the other couple of things that come to mind for me. One is, and looking at the at the draft ordinance, is the um, this notion of licensed activities. It, it may be a given that you know, for instance, for a restaurant that's got a liquor license, if they're going to expand onto the rooftop, that's going to expand the licensed um, space. I assume they're going to have to amend their liquor license to 
to reflect that. We may just want to add that as something that you have to do as part of doing rooftop dining to the extent there's any licensed activities going on on the premises, they would have to be, the, the license would have to be amended to incorporate that. Um, the other thing that come to mind for me, um, I was not at the, I was at the, um, at the kind of work session discussion of this, but I wasn't able to be at the, at the regular meeting where we discussed this and I, I know we touched on this notion of the difference between rooftop dining and outdoor seating. And I don't know, was there more discussion about that? You know, particularly at that 50th in France area, um, we were recognizing that, you know, for instance, I think it's um, um, Edana Grill that has outdoor seating right outside of their restaurant. What's the difference between that and the rooftop other than, you know, the rooftop is higher up in the air, but they're both creating outdoor um, noise and sound and and the like. And did we, is there another portion of the code that deals with outdoor seating right now, or is that just part of part of what we do with restaurants? It would be a, the proposed ordinance doesn't address that. It, they would continue to be permitted uses. We did take a look at all of our outdoor dining, um, the sidewalk at grade. And they would all fall, fall below that 20% of the size of the, the restaurant that's associated. So given that, I guess staff's thinking was. Um, I see. So you'd have a 20% kind of exception that's a de minimis. Right. We're not gonna we're not gonna get into the business of figuring out whether you do that or not. Right. So we're comfortable if you you can go up on the rooftop so long as you're less than 20% of. You'd still need a conditional use permit, but if you're under the 20%, you don't have to provide the parking. Mr. Chair. What if you do both? Do you get 20% in each location? That's an excellent question. As it's, as it's written now, it was just on the rooftop where that 20% would be triggered. But if that's something that we want to factor in, we certainly could. I do think in, in some of the areas where I think this will be the most attractive, it is conceivable that some popular restaurants at certain times of the year might want to be engaging in both. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. Other thoughts? Uh, it sounds like uh, we're not ready to uh, move this on to the City Council yet. Uh, it sounds like we'd like to take a look at, you know, the definition of rooftop dining uh, and <clears throat> in some alternative ways. One is strictly the restaurant and one might include catering and that type of thing and then some consideration on uh, the issues of safety and uh, and uh, railings and that type of thing. And then also this last issue on, you know, what happens down on the street level and how does that all tie together? Is that, is that fair enough for a charge to the uh, staff to take a look at? I, I don't think there's anything, uh, no one's pushing this ordinance right now, are they? No. Okay. Sure, sure. Would anybody in the audience wish to comment on rooftop dining? Nobody wants. We haven't hit it yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we, we will pass that back to the staff for uh, some further study and analysis. Yeah, if I could just ask one clarification as I'm putting this together. So should I should put something in here that talks about a combination of the um, outdoor dining on the ground and on the roof, and if it hits a certain threshold, then they're going to need to require um, additional parking? I think so, definitely. And I, I know that if Commissioner Forrest were here, she would agree, based on our last conversation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That makes sense. Next up. Okay, the next one is the side yard setback requirement. And this was uh, 
this came up as part of the um, uh, discussion in the country club district that our current code regulation that any time a building exceeds 15 feet in height, the setback has to increase. And that's preventing colonials from being built uh, within, within the, that heritage district. So we had looked at a code that would exempt them uh, from that requirement. And the thinking was if someone were to uh, build an addition in the country club off the back of their house, they could use that exemption, but there wouldn't be any review uh, required from the uh, Heritage Preservation Board. So the suggestion was we should require a, a certificate of appropriateness in that situation that if someone's going to use that exemption in the code, there should be some type of a uh, review. So with that in mind, we brought that back to the Heritage Preservation Board for their consideration, and they concurred with the Planning Commission that that would be a, a good idea. So what's before you is an ordinance that incorporates that specific language that actually requires by code that a certificate of appropriateness um, would be required from the Heritage Preservation Board if someone were to use that exemption. So if the, if the commission is comfortable with this, we could forward that on to the, to the uh, city council for their consideration. Thank you, Kerry. Comments? So the, uh, as I'm getting the, the idea is to have an alternative if it's going to, it's either going to be governed by the certificate of appropriateness from the HPB or by the setbacks that we deal with. Right. They would be allowed that exemption, but it's subject to approval from the okay. Heritage Preservation Board. When it refers to um, dwell, single dwelling lots, single dwelling unit lots designated as the Dinah Heritage Landmarks, do we need to, in, is, it, is it the ones designated as landmarks or do we need to include the district? Do we need to refer to the district or the landmarks or how? I, I just don't know. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, this, this uh, came to be as a suggestion from the city uh, attorney that, this, that that's an overlay zoning classification. Um, and if we can tie this regulation to a zoning classification, we can give them an exemption. It, it's a different standard from our R1 districts. Rather than rezoning the country club or any, anybody that's designated as um, Edina Heritage Landmark, it's a designation that's on our zoning ordinance or on our zoning map as a zoning overlay. But so anybody so, that's... So is every property that is within that overlay district a designated historic landmark? You see what I'm driving... Within the city, yes. Okay. So, I mean, so long as if there were, if there were sites within that district that are not designated historic landmarks, then this language would not apply to those sites. Correct. Okay. Commissioner Sheriff. Uh, Commissioner Stanton, I, I believe I'm correct in this from my time on the Heritage Board. The 564 properties or whatever are the number is are all designated okay. within Country Club. And of course, there are some other miscellaneous properties scattered around Edina oh. that are individually designated. Okay, yep. Other comments, questions? Are we prepared to move this on to City Council? I would say yes. I'd be prepared to make that motion. Make that motion? It is now moved. <laughs> Second. Second. Okay, been moved and seconded to uh, pr submit to the City Council for approval of the ordinance amendment concerning setback, side yard setbacks in the Dinah Heritage Landmark Districts. Is there any further discussion? Is there any comment from, I'm, I will ask, I know it's not yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, is there any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. That will move on. Next up. Our next ordinance is the uh, a zoning uh, ordinance amendment that would establish the Planning Commission as the Zoning Board of Appeals. This, this um, comes as a result of the work session that we had with the City Council. So it's simply the language that that establishes the Planning Commission as the Zoning Board, it does away with the current Zoning Board of, of Appeals. What the ordinance does not do is address specifically 
when or how we choose to meet. That's something that, that we can decide here. As the Zoning Board of Appeals hasn't met since last summer, given the Krumenacher decision, um, it, it's not a, an issue that we need to settle tonight, but might be worth um, some discussion on it. A couple of things that we've talked about um, have a regular a zoning, have the Planning Commission meet as the Zoning Board at 5.30 or 5 or whatever time you may choose, the night of a Planning Commission meeting. Um, could be televised, wouldn't have to be televised. I think that's something that we'll discuss later in the meeting, the, the policy regarding uh, televised meeting. Another option that's been thrown out is we just have variances considered on your regular agenda. Con could continue to meet at 7 o'clock, maybe earlier, 6.30. Again, nothing that we need to settle on this evening. The ordinance before you is just simply establishing the Planning Commission as the Zoning Board of Appeals. So with that, I can turn it over to the Commission for discussion. Comments from the Commission. Um, Carrie, as I'm looking at the, um, at the draft, are the, the cross-outs, I, I see that there's one underlined passage that's highlighted. And then there are a number of cross-outs. Are all the cross-outs part of the changes that we're contemplating here? Correct. So um, the one thing that we did talk about as we worked through this was how when we have a combined situation, so we've got um, maybe there's a variance in a conditional use permit or a variance in a final plan approval, that there would be a kind of automatic appeal to the city council so that we might quote unquote grant the variance, but since the whole project is going with our recommendation on the CUP or the final plan or whatever it might be to the council, that the variances would go with it. Is there language in here that, that accomplishes that? Uh, not in this document before you, but that language has been added to the code as part of our, our last ordinance change the, where we changed the entire um, administration and procedure section 850.04. That automatic appeal language is already That's in existing there. in the That's code. right. That's right. Thank you for that reminder. Yes. Let's say if maybe someone can comment on this. What would be the pros and cons of, of having the um, ZBA not televised? In other words, it's an earlier time. I know there is some concerns on with residential coming in that it'd be a little more informal at that point? Was that, was that what that's getting at? That was uh, certainly part of it. Um, another part of it is a lot of times we're looking at details of home designs and interior function of the home. Um, I, I've, we've heard some reservation about putting those kind of things on TV, um, the specifics of somebody's home. Um, another thing to, to consider. Other comments? Uh, do we have a motion? Mr. Chair, can, um, the, the, I think the draft ordinance makes a lot of sense. Do we want to do the draft ordinance and then have the discussion about the meeting configuration or do you want to put that off for another day or what? or discuss it in conjunction with the television discussion later in the meeting. I, I guess I'm, in, I'm not sure how to attack that. Uh, given, the, uh, given the time, I think I would prefer to, to pass this ordinance on to the City Council tonight and hold comment on how we internally organize this and have the meetings until another meeting when it becomes more germane perhaps. And maybe when we actually have a variance to consider. I'd make that motion. So, so your motion is to pass this ordinance on to the City Council with our approval? Correct. Is there a second? Second. Is there any other, any discussion from the audience? <laughs> <laughs> uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Very good. Thank you. Next up. Uh, 
our, ne our next item was the uh, small wind and solar renewable energy systems ordinance that uh, brought forward by Syria Iyer, um, a member of that commission. He had requested that we text him 10 minutes before he was to go on. We did that about 15 minutes ago, and he's texted back stating that he's got an emergency at home, he's got a water leak, and he can't make it. He asked if Mike could address it. If not, if Mike wasn't comfortable in that, we can continue this to our next meeting. I would rather not. He has the more more information on it, so I would recommend the continuance. Would, would you like to? <laughs> well, before we continue this on, since, since you're here, we would appreciate hearing your thoughts on this ordinance. Please. Okay. Well, there has been an ordinance proposed uh, by the Energy and Environment Commission concerning small wind solar renewable energy systems, what we do with windmills and that type of thing. Uh, in the city of Edina, and that's what the ordinance is. Um, I don't know if you've seen this or not. Okay, Do you ha would you care to give any comments? Just give your thoughts tonight. I, we will uh, wait until Sari's back to, uh, to be able to pre present this in greater detail, but I don't want you to think that you came here for no reason at all, so. <laughs> <laughs> If you'd care to address the issue tonight, we'd be happy to hear from you. Uh, you want to come and give us your name and address, please? And My name is Richard Griffith. I'm a member of the um, uh, Energy and Environment Work Group, the energy part of it. And um, uh, in um, October of last year, one of our members, John Spanicky, um, brought to our attention the, um, well, we knew there was a need for ordinances for solar and wind, small solar and wind. We're not talking about huge towers. We're talking about uh, devices that may have 5, 10 kilowatt capability. It could be attractive to... Uh, residents and uh, we're concerned about um, people putting them uh, next to their post you know their mailbox or or putting them next to their neighbor's dog house or so we um, um, were concerned about that and John Spanicky found that in Naperville Illinois they had done a pretty thorough job of uh, uh, initiating ordinances for their city and uh, we obtained through John copies of their work and um, that is the starting point for the ordinances for Edina, Minnesota. Now um, Commissioner Latham, um, our boss essentially, asked the question about, well, how's Naperville doing with that? Have they finished their ordinances? Uh, are they happy? Have they time-tested the ordinances? And uh, what do we know about that? And, and we actually have not checked back. Uh, she said the first thing the Planning Commission is going to ask is, well, how did Naperville do with it? <laughs> so um, it's, it's probably good that you're uh, continuing this because that is uh, an, a very active question that the uh, um, our working group will answer at our next meeting, which will be April 19, I think. So we'll have more information for everybody at that point, but I think it would be wise to continue at this basis. Great. So that's Thank all I have to say. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Griffith. Any Good. questions? We just got a text from Syria saying he's on his way now. Oh, oh all right. <laughs> Good. All right. Well, in that case, let's uh, until he uh, until he arrives. Uh, 
why don't we suspend discussion on this topic and uh, uh, and move on to uh, the next item. We'll come back to this. The next item on the agenda is community comment, uh, at which time residents and those in the audience who wish to address the commission are welcome to do so. Uh, is there anyone in the audience who wishes to address the commission on any issue? It appears that it appears not. <laughs> Uh, interge intergovernmental business you received in your packet, the council connection. Um, oh, Carrie, would you handle this next one, the policy regarding filming the planning commission meetings? I remember we did receive uh, communication about that. Yes, certainly. Yes. This was a, a request of the council through uh, city manager Scott Neal. Uh, they're looking for feedback in regard to um, commissions and policy regarding whether they should be filmed or not. I, I think it's pretty safe to say the Planning Commission will stay televised. Um, so maybe this is more for the Zoning Board of Appeals. But they've asked some specific questions that you uh, consider. Um, he's, they're not asking that we take a vote on it, just provide comments and those comments would be then forwarded on to the City Manager and then to the City Council. So the first is, do you believe that filming your commission meeting and subsequently rebroadcasting the filmed meeting on cable television would change the matter in which commissioners or guests behave or participate in a commission meeting? Uh, the second, do you believe there are circumstances where filming and rebroadcasting your commission meetings would not be in the public interest? If so, what would be an example of such a circumstance? And third, do you believe that filming and rebroadcasting your commission meetings is an important tool to communicating your commission's activities and discussions with the public? And then fourth is, is there any other additional input that you'd like to comment on? Well, as we are being filmed, uh, this will be available to uh, Mr. Neal. Our comments will be available to Mr. Neal. So would anybody care to comment on any of those questions? Commissioner Scherer? Um, I guess I'm approaching the latter half of my second term and we've been filmed the entire time that I've been on the commission. Uh, and I honestly do not think that it has had an, any negative impact. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I know some people get nervous, but I think uh, the, the several chairmen that I've served under and the other members, uh, you know, have worked hard to make it uh, comfortable or as comfortable as possible for people to speak and, and been patient and encouraged all participants. Uh, and I, I hear comments all the time from people in the community who have watched the meetings, uh, who call me and who are obviously getting a lot of information uh, and unable to attend meetings, but they get it via their television. And to me that really um, weighs heavily uh, and, and says that we need to continue doing this. I wouldn't, I wouldn't think there would be any reason that we would not continue, particularly with this commission. Mr. Stanton? I, I think it might sometimes have a, um, an effect on the, on the manner in which uh, folks conduct themselves, but generally in a positive way. <laughs> um, there is something about knowing that lots and lots of people can be watching that sometimes moderates people's behaviors or uh, helps them control the impulses they might otherwise have. Um, on the question of, um, of are there any circumstances where we shouldn't be filming. Uh, you know, somebody raised an interesting one tonight about um, the zoning boards, and it, it sounds like we'll kind of try to address that later. But I, I'm a big believer that the, you know, we've got some state statutes that, that address, you know, what's available to the public and what isn't available to the public in terms of the Open Meeting Law and the Data Practices Act. And I, I think it's kind of, um, if, if something is, is open to the public and available to the public, then we ought to be televising it. I, I think it just provides greater access for folks who are interested and um, there are people who sometimes might have a, a water emergency at home or something and can't get down to a, a meeting. And <laughs> but they may want to know what happened <laughs> and that way they can watch on TV. So I, I'm a, in general, you know, absent some really compelling reason, I don't, 
I can't think of a circumstance under which we wouldn't want to um, televise our meetings. Is, does anyone on the, on the commission disagree with the comments that we've just heard about this? I, you know, I, I think I think it's a good idea, and we need to continue, and it's it's a favorable thing. Subject to discussion, we could have at a later time on some of the, the residential zoning issues before the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, Carrie, is that sufficient comment, do you believe, for? All right, now moving, uh, moving back to the issue of the ordinance on uh, small wind and solar renewable energy systems, it's possible that there's someone in the audience that might wish to comment on that. and Environment Commission. And thank you for uh, giving me the time to come and present on this. Um, what I want to, I want to take about 10 minutes of your time and uh, talk about this uh, solar PV and wind renewables ordinance uh, that the Energy Commission and actually a working group within the Energy Commission, uh, the Energy Working Group has come up with. And the reason I'm bringing it to you today is that I think the um, it's, it's, uh, it involves a lot of zoning type of um, uh, language that really uh, comes under the purview of the Planning Commission and not under the purview of the Energy and Environment Commission. So if this has to go forward uh, to City Council, um, it will have to be, I, in my opinion, and I think in the EEC's opinion, I, I represent their opinion, it will have to go either through you, uh, your body, or jointly from both the Planning Commission and the Energy and Environment Commission. So um, I'm going to walk through these few slides here quickly, and then I'll tell you what I want uh, from, uh, from the Planning Commission. So um, just a motivation. I have uh, – this was – about a year or year and a half ago, um, I had meetings with um, Mayor Hubland and other members of the council who expressed to me that um, it was a good time for the Energy and Environment Commission to come up with an ordinance that puts together some sort of rules and regulations and guidance, really, for um, city residents if they want to put um, solar PV or uh, residential solar PV or wind. And um, I think uh, we're, we're already seeing many of our neighbors putting um, at least solar PV. I haven't seen too many wind but, uh, and other kinds of renewables. So I think it's um, good timing that we need to uh, take this forward. Um, so we, uh, EEC approved this ordinance, uh, actually approved me coming to you and presenting it. Uh, in summary, uh, the purpose of this ordinance is to provide zoning regulations to guide the installation of these uh, small size wind and solar. Um, I'm not going to go through every bullet point here. I think some of them are pretty self-explanatory. Uh, the applicability is uh, mostly to residential type of installations, not large. Um, the large wind energy systems are not uh, we think they're not, uh, they should not be permitted. Uh, or, you know, the city council, of course, can make, ex make exceptions. Um, and whatever is not addressed here will have to be addressed in other existing codes and standards. The next slide I have here is um, kind of a general timeline and approach. What I am suggesting, this is something that, you know, is up for discussion and uh, agreement with your uh, body. Um, we generate, the EEC generates the draft, which is already done. Um, what I'd like to do is propose that the EEC Planning Commission and city staff all have, you know, one or two members who can more formally go through this draft, um, revise it, get it, get it into ship shape that we can go and present it to city council. And I just pulled this target date 
just, you know, out of thin air. I'm thinking by um, third fisc uh, calendar quarter, uh, we have it ready and we present it to city council. So it's not an unreasonable timeline. I think it can be done. Um, so my goal today is to get agreement from Planning Commission that Planning Commission would contribute a member or if you want, you can take over the whole thing and drive it. That's fine with uh, the EEC as well. Um, we did borrow heavily. I, I do have to acknowledge that uh, there's a very um, well done ordinance by the city of Naperville, Illinois, which is a very similar city to um, in size and composition to Edina. Um, so it's, uh, they've done a really good job. So most of this is uh, actually quite um, similar to that ordinance. So I, and actually, um, Chair um, Latham, who's the EEC chair, uh, sent me an email today asking me to check with the city of Naperville and see how it's going. So that's something that I think is a good idea, and I'll, I'll follow up and do that. Um, so here's how I see the roles and responsibilities divided between the EEC, Planning Commission, and city staff. Um, it's really, I think, our EEC's role is pretty much done now. Uh, we've put in, we've made the draft, we've got the renewable energy related information in there already. Now there's a lot of stuff that involves zoning. Um, so you know, I, I'm not familiar, I think your uh, commission and you, uh, uh, your body is much more familiar with some of these terminology of how the city um, is divided into different districts and you know, residential and so on and so forth. So some of those things have to be cleaned up. Um, some of the dimensions that we came up with, you know, height and uh, things like that need to be, we need to make sure that they're compatible with other ordinances and um, codes that are already in existence. Similar things with setbacks, noise, color. I mean, there's a lot of things that um, I, I, I feel, or I think uh, are really um, under your jurisdiction rather than the EECs. So, and then there's, of course, an important role to be played by city staff as well, uh, which is um, there's a lot of um, references to the city engineer. So we need to make sure that the city engineer is okay with, <laughs> with a lot of the stuff that I put in there. Uh, conditional use guidelines, time dependent. I mean, there's some um, time numbers that I put in there. So for example, you know, you get a 90 day um, uh, time frame for you to get, uh, for a resident to go and get um, permissions from the city and things like that. So I want to make sure the city um, is okay with some of those uh, kind of time guidelines. And then um, we didn't have any legal counsel input, so I think that'll be a significant part to make sure the um, city um, legal counsel gives his input. And that's pretty much it. So my goal of coming here tonight is to request the Planning Commission um, to agree to the path that I've suggested or the Planning Commission's welcome to suggest its own path to take this uh, forward. And um, I'm, I'm ready to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, I, if I might start, I have a question. What is happening in the city right now? What is going on in the city with respect to this type of renewable energy? You know, are, are people building, are people putting these things on the roof? Or do we have any windmills in the city? Uh, so on and so on and so on. What's going on right now? So um, I am pretty sure that there's not any windmill installations in residential um, homes. Um, but I think there is some installations of solar PV. Uh, most of them are roof mounted. That being uh, the black pipes that are on the roof to heat water? Uh, well, uh, photovoltaic. Oh, photovoltaic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I think there's also the solar thermal, which is the one that you referred to. Okay. So there's some installations of that technology as well. And there's geothermal. I think uh, there's a couple of uh, residences, at least one that I am aware of that has geothermal. That's not under the um, uh, scope of this uh, uh, ordinance that we put together. So, but, but there's a few examples here and there. 
and I think it's just going to grow. I mean, our um, community is uh, fairly forward-looking in some of these uh, um, concepts, and I'm pretty sure that it's just going to be more and more. But I can, uh, uh, Commissioner G Grabiel, um, I will try to get more, um, you know, real data to answer your question. I was kind of vague, but I'll try and get you some real numbers. Yeah. Uh, are there, do these installations fall subject to any code? Does a permit need to be pulled? Uh, typically building permits would be required. Okay, so we're, we're at that stage. Yeah, and actually our current zoning ordinance does address this. It's, it's a real small paragraph, but it's, it, um, it's pretty broad. So our current code does allow energy collection systems. So that would include um, solar and wind, wind energy. So surprisingly, our code does address that. So someone was forward thinking um, years back. In residential districts, you could, have a, you could have a windmill up to 18 feet tall as long as it meets required setbacks and it can't be located in a front yard. So in a side or rear yard, um, you could have solar panels on your house or a windmill in your backyard. Mm -hmm. If it's a freestanding, 18 feet is the maximum height. Um, if it's attached to the, to the roof, some type of uh, equipment, it just can't exceed our maximum um, building height requirement, overall height requirement, right? And that same goes for our commercial districts as well. Um, they're subject to the setback and, and building height requirements. Can, can I add something to what was said previously? Um, Mr. Greg Nelson's uh, Good morning. I have something to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Greg Nelson, I live at 6120 Hanson Road. And um, as far as solar in the area, it is going to increase. Um, I, I own an installation company that does solar as well as home automation, home theater. It's been around for 22 years and solar is just at its infancy stage in this area, you know, in the state. And um, there's a few things that are in play right now. The legislature may pass a renewable energy credit, which is something similar that the state of New Jersey did and 18 other states did. And what that basically does is allow the homeowner to have energy credits that they can put on the the market, a financial market, and it makes their payback change from 30 to 50 years down to five or 10 years. And that's usually the stumbling block that holds people back. Um, so we do see that uh, coming relatively quickly. Um, and even if the state doesn't pass it, the price of solar is coming down and the, the interest is, is growing. In fact, the state had a rebate last year and they ran out of their money in the first month when the year before, it took 10 months to, to go through their, their funding. Um, and, th and then one other thing I wanted to add, and this is probably making life harder for installation companies, but we did do an installation in the city of Edina, and I called the, the building department to ask what the process was, and I was told that uh, no building permit was needed, just get the electrical inspector involved, and when you're done, give us a call. They'd like to come and see it. So I'm not sure that uh, the planning department or the building department is all that versed in solar. Um, and I think Surya is right. There's not any wind as far as we know happening. And there probably won't be much wind. It's not the best area for wind, but it doesn't keep people from putting systems up. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Other questions? Uh of the commission comments I'll just chime in that I I think it's a terrific idea and and glad that you um, have taken the steps to kind of start crafting something and I think we ought to work together to try and figure out how we incorporate it into the code and you know it it may be that that we have kind of the the land use regulatory piece of it and that that the Energy and Environment Commission can be doing some thinking about how do we encourage folks to, you know, to do more of this um, within those parameters. So um, I think it's a great, uh, you know, we've talked about 
kind of our goals for the zoning ordinance and one of them has been to pursue more kind of sustainable building um, components and this isn't exactly on that but it's certainly related to that whole updating our ordinances to make it friendlier to renewable energy and sustainable concepts so I I'm all for moving forward with it obviously we've got some work to do to kind of grind through it but I think it's a great idea yeah, thank you Commissioner Staunton I, I, just to mention one more thing um, uh, a while ago when I met with uh, chair Fisher um, one of the objectives uh, was to get certainly the Energy Commission to work closer with the Planning Commission because there's a lot of overlap that we think that we can help or make uh, you know significant change towards uh, good towards the you know the, in the right direction for the city and Chair Fisher was uh, quite uh, enthusiastic about this so this is kind of in that way enough uh, collaboration between Energy Commission and Planning Commission so and I, certainly I think the EEC looks forward to working on this with the, with the Planning Commission so your suggestion was that a task force be uh, established with members of the Energy Environment Commission with members of the Planning Commission and with uh, representatives from the city uh, to review the ordinance to come up with a recommendation to your group this group which would be passed on to the City Council for an ordinance am I stating your recommendation correctly that is accurate uh, um, my thoughts on that is as your chair is that we do that and that we appoint one or two members of the Planning Commission to that kind of task force uh, and as a subcommittee of the Planning Commission and then we move forward on that uh, I'm open to other suggestions uh, from the people here tonight if you think there's a better way to to handle that issue uh, if you did agree to that I would take it upon myself to contact I would like to hear from each of you if you'd be interested in serving on that and I will contact the other members uh, who are not here tonight to see if they are interested in, in serving on that and we would at our next meeting we could formally appoint a subcommittee um, uh, to move forward on this so that's that's my suggestion anyway and I'm open to alternate alternatives I can see I would be interested in, in uh, serving on that Just to clarify, would would the idea be that the subcommittee would be reporting to our um, zoning ordinance review body, and we would incorporate these recommendations in those overall recommendations? I think that's one way we could go. Mm -hmm. Well, the zoning ordinance review body is really a, a, this body meeting as a committee of the whole. So whether or not we designate it as such, I mean, I think that's, I think that's how it would. How it would move forward, and eventually, this commission would have to consider a draft and make a recommendation of, of that draft. So, it, it would I'm, be a little slower than the timetable that we were talking about, because I don't think we're going to resolve all of the issues for that broader review. So, my question is: Should we pull it out of that, or should we include it in that broader review? I understand your question now. Um, we seem to have. We started out with the idea we were going to do this all in one fell swoop, consider all of these ordinance amendments and then draft a, a complete ordinance and submit it to the council. And we've gotten to a point where we are, we are doing things as they come up. And I don't see any reason why this could not be done that way as well. If we come up with a good idea and a good, or, good ordinance for this, we would move it on. It would be time. more timely. Yes, I think you're right. Uh, Mr. Chair, I would also be willing to serve on this committee, subcommittee. Well, with the, uh, with the commission's permission, then I will move ahead as I suggested 
Uh, I do want to talk to the other members of the uh, Planning Commission and we'll appoint, uh, we will appoint members to a, uh, a task force, if you want, and we'll get together with you and your folks and you and your folks and we'll come up with a great ordinance for the city of Edina. Does that uh, make sense? Sure, Graviel, I think that makes a lot of sense. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you okay. for coming Thank tonight. You. Agenda. Okay, the uh, <clears throat> Commissioner Stanton, do you have an update on the Grandview small area plan process? I do, and I'll be brief. Um, we have, um, I'm trying to think the last time that I talked with the um, Commission about this. On, on March 1st, we appeared in front of the City Council and asked for permission to proceed with a small area plan process and received that permission and have been crafting a process that will kick off on April 14th. Uh, we have currently scheduled a meeting for April 14th to start the process and a second meeting on April 21st. Um, the meeting on April 14th will be held here in the Council Chambers beginning at 7 p.m and we invite all members of the public who might be interested in the process to come and join us as we try to take the seven guiding principles that we created as part of the initial phase of this process and convert them to a full-blown small area plan. And uh, the meeting on the 21st of April will be held at the Senior Center. Um, and the, <clears throat> the hope is at that meeting to break into smaller working groups to work on various components of the small area plan. And again, we're just uh, we're looking to invite as many people as possible to participate. And certainly any members of the commission are welcome to join us. And uh, if you can spread the word with your friends and neighbors as well that this process is going on, it's much appreciated. What are the times on the 14th and the 21st? Uh, 7 p.m. on the 14th and 7 p.m. on the 21st. And we generally try to make those two-hour meetings so that people can count on being done by 9 o'clock. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Kevin? Thank you very much. Um, the next Planning Commission meeting is set for April 27 which will be here, the public is invited. And the last item I have is that tonight is Marty Dahl's last meeting uh, with the uh, Planning Commission. No longer will we hear your dulcet tones as you explain the process to the people. Uh, we certainly thank you for your assistance and your work on the Commission's behalf, and we wish you well. What are you, what are you going to be doing? <laughs> I am actually headed uh, south of the river. I will be the head of the communications department for the city of Burnsville. My first day there is April 11th. And it's been my pleasure to serve this board, so thank you. Well, Edina's loss is Burnsville's gain, and uh, again, we wish you uh, all the best, and thank you very much. Thank you. Congratulations and good luck. Uh, any other business to come before the uh, commission this evening? Commissioner Shear. I, I wanted to make note, I think we all got um, an email from uh, citizen Michael Gorman uh, asking that we add to our ordinance review a couple of items, which I think are, are worth noting. Uh, one is uh, the issue of the placement of satellite dish receivers and mm -hmm. ties in in some way to our earlier discussion this evening. Uh, regarding the Energy Commission and uh, discussion about uh, numbers of cars that ought to reside in driveways. Uh, I did receive that email uh, and I did discuss it with Carrie. Before I discussed it with Carrie, I took a look at the current code and uh, it would appear that the picture of the house with the satellite dish is in violation of a current code section, as is the, uh, the pickup <laughs> truck in the guy's driveway. So. Those, those items are already covered uh, in the city code, so it may be that we don't have to uh, add those to our agenda since uh, the code already 
covers us. My suggestion to him would be that he contact the uh, building department uh, and have him check out whether or not there's a code violation there. So, <laughs> and we thank him for bringing that to the city's attention. <laughs> May I ask a question, Carrie? In, in what way is the uh, truck in the driveway in violation? I'm not noting that part of the code, I guess. I, I don't have those pictures in front of me. Okay. But my, my thought was it looked like it was an inoperable vehicle. Oh. And right. there's a, you, there is a, uh, as I recall, and I'm not sure, I think there was a, a restriction on the number of vehicles that could be parked. Uh, I'm not in, aware in of that. Okay. I'll, I, I don't have it, the It does seem to, to be growing as you drive around town. Yeah. I would say that. But there is a, there is a current code section dealing with that issue, so... Uh, I'll look it up and okay, I'll let you know. Okay. Other business. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? Second. We are adjourned. Thank you very much.